Good morning, and welcome to the Ventura County Board of Supervisors meeting. And it is, um, today is November 23rd, and welcome to your boardroom. And if we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Bennett? Here. Supervisor Zaragoza? Here. Supervisor Parks? Here. Supervisor Foy? Here. Supervisor Long? Here. Thank you. And now it is uh, my pleasure to invite up to share with us a moment of inspiration, uh, someone who's familiar to all of us, Bonnie Weigel, who's the president and CEO of FoodShare. Bonnie has more than 10 years of experience in this nonprofit sector, has uh, led the food chair, building relationships in the community, um, working with an operating budget of $2.9 million. But as we know, uh, the challenges are daily. The challenges are still continuing to provide food to over 55,000 people monthly who are served by food share. And Bonnie does an outstanding job with great support from the community and volunteers. And thank you for being here this morning to inspire us, Bonnie. Thank you so much. So the moment of inspiration I was thinking about this last night. And yesterday alone, I had six different moments of inspiration just from uh, pull the our mics community. together for you, Bonnie. Sure. And so this story this year with this season is interesting. And just now, you know, we've updated our numbers again. Last fiscal year, we helped over 168,000 people in Ventura County. We're up to 61,000 friends a month that we're serving. And we're very grateful that we're able to do that. But the moment of inspiration really came from a conversation I had uh, with one of our growers. And we were talking about Thanksgiving and what we needed to have. And very quickly got on the phone and helped us with a community that we're going to be serving 400 friends for in Oxnard. And it was amazing how quickly you could tell one person what you needed. They got on the phone and they were to help uh, an entire community that will happen tomorrow. And the reason I mention that is Ventura County is so wonderful at connecting those dots. And it just starts with awareness and education. And so because of that, there are many more friends that we've been able to help, 50% more in the last two years. And we know it starts here at this level and from the grassroots. And when you kind of sandwich the two together, what you find is an increased method and mode to serve more and more people. Are the number of pantries that we have has grown. The number of friends that we have has grown. The amount of food that we have it's just coming. It's wonderful from the grocery stores, from the fields, and really from the hearts of people that are doing food donations every single day. So we're very grateful for that. And thank you for allowing me to share and update you. Madam Chair, can yes. I know you're going to, share, you're going to give a presentation, but I'd like to thank um, Bonnie. I've known her since she was a little girl. And this, then the next thing, job, you know, with the food share and helping the community uh, of Fox Nard in Ventura County. And I'd also like to share that you probably know that she was uh, the winner of Dancing with the Stars over at Salsa and Oxford. <laughs> the Salsa Festival did an excellent job. For, and you raised how many thousands of dollars or hundreds of dollars? How much was it, Bonnie? I can't remember what it was. Uh, we, I, yeah, I did. I raised over $48,000 dancing. It was very, very significant. We'll do anything for Great future job. to raise dollars yeah. to help feed people. <laughs> <laughs> and you did an excellent job, so I wanted to share that with, with the public, that not only is she the executive there at Food Share, but also is a good fundraiser. Great. And thank, thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. And if, we, if you stay right there, I'm going to, because this is the season, I'm going to, uh, and as, as we position this on the agenda, uh, present a resolution to Food Share as they kick off their Tackle Hunger Food and Fun Drive. And, uh, I brought my boss. Very good, <laughs> Melissa, good to see you. Um, and this is certainly the season, uh, that is November 1st through January 11th, where FoodShare undertakes a tremendous task um, in holding this annual Tackle Hunger Food and Fund Drive campaign to collect food and funds for hungry friends and neighbors to address the issue of hunger in our county. We all think uh, and know that we are very rich in this county. We're blessed with so many things, but there are many in this county who are in great need, and that need is um, a very basic one of hunger. And Food Share does a tremendous job reaching out to all of the community members to answer a call to action to help them feed the hungry at a time when there is a continuing increase in the number of Americans and certainly the number of residents in our county who are hungry, unable to purchase enough food to sometimes meet basic nutritional needs. 
Food Bank seeks to work with all members of our community to overcome hunger as a form of human poverty. And we ask, and they ask that we all join hands with Food Share um, during this next month and a half, um, two months and a half, actually. Um, and it is to really develop that partnership that will help us to feed the hungry here in our county. Uh, increase in Ventura County where one in six residents are food insecure. Food Chair Foundation was built on um, great faith and, and volunteers and guided by many in this county who work in this network. Over 150 local nonprofit partners, agencies, feeding over, as Bonnie just said, 61,000 and growing a month. Um, it's supported by many corporations, faith-based organizations, and individuals. And as um, Food Chair Inc. of Ventura County supportive staff and caring volunteers have worked now for 33 years to combat hunger, hunger and provide nutrition here in our county. So as we move into this season, November 1st through January 11th, to tackle hunger, food, and fun drive campaign. And so we all can have a role and we can all can step forward to support those who are in great need in our county. And I'd like to step down to present this to you and please say a few words about the drive. Great. Now, do you want to offer? Yeah, so I just want to thank the board for your continued support of future, and especially at this time of year. The Tackling Hunger campaign is one of our biggest events during the year, and as you've heard, food insecurity is a, is a major problem nationwide, but very concerning for our own community. And of that one in six that the supervisor mentioned, one in five of those are children, uh, which is even a more concerning uh, uh, dilemma for us in our community. So um, it's an important time. I appreciate your support. It's a community issue, and your board's leadership is, is very important to us in support of our campaign. And Madam Chair, if I could, I just and Bonnie Bonnie started off by mentioning she was talking to a grower, and I just one of the other one of the, you've talked about the things we have to be grateful for here. I think we have to be grateful that we have um, the strong agriculture industry, and many of those growers are very generous with food share. I know, and uh, that's a that's a real blessing for for those people in, in our county that are dependent upon food share. So thank you for all the good work that both of you are doing there. Appreciate thank you again to all of you. We are so grateful for your ongoing support and. I don't know that you mentioned, Supervisor, that you and Supervisor Zaragoza are co-chairs again this year for Tackle Hunger. And so hopefully you'll have lots of thank you letters to sign again this year thank to you. all those that helped us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Why don't we take uh, thank you, a picture here? Okay. Melissa, please join us. Turn on this one. All right. Ready? One. Now, board members, we have item six, which is to approve the minutes that have been presented by the clerk of the board. It's a motion and a second. Second. To adopt the minutes. Please vote. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, agenda review. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Chair. Uh, time certain item number 34, there has been a letter submitted by Maria Mason. Uh, and time certain item 36, there's a letter submitted by Patty Kaminsky. Uh, regular agenda item number 44, we're requesting continuous to December 7th. And regular agenda item 47, we are also requesting continuous to December 7th. What was that second one? 47? 47. That's all I have at this point in time. Okay, board members, any other comments on agenda review? 
Okay, motion to adopt the agenda as revised. So moved. Motion in the second. Please vote. And that passes unanimously. Next up, we have our consent agenda, agenda items 10 through 28. Any request on the consent? Okay, then that's before us for action. Move approval. It's a motion. Second. And a second to adopt the consent agenda. Please vote. And that passes unanimously. Okay, very good. Thank you. Now we have an opportunity to go through public comment. Okay, I have 12 cards submitted to speak to the board this morning. I appreciate everyone being present who wish to do so. And I'd like to certainly invite up our first speaker, who is Earl Greenia. And Earl is our CEO of our COOs, our COHS, our County Organized Health System. And he's just been in the county three weeks, three weeks. He's hit the ground running. I expect he's had an opportunity to meet with some of you, but I invited him here this morning so he can, one, we can welcome him, and he can certainly speak to the challenges ahead and the opportunities ahead. Madam Chair, before we start with 12 speakers, can you tell me what the time, how much time each speaker is going to have? Three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Long. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Earl Greenia. I'm the three-week CEO on the job for the Gold Coast Health Plan, which is a county-organized health care system or the managed care Medi-Cal program, hopefully soon to start in the coming months for the County of Ventura. I'm only here today so you can put a face to the name, and I can do the same. It's an exciting challenge that we have before us, and I am quite honored to lead that challenge. Thank you. Board members? I just wanted to say welcome. We did see your resume and all that, and it's very impressive. I think they've made a very good choice based on what I've seen, and I wish you the best of luck. It's quite a challenge. Thank you, Supervisor Parks. I appreciate that. I look forward to the positive results. Thank you. And I just wanted to say that you're doing really important work, and it's something we really value a lot. But we have a remarkable series of things that have come together, and people have come together. And so we just want to let you know how important we think the work is and wish you well, and let us know how we can help you be successful. Supervisor Bennett, thank you. I agree with you completely. And Earl, welcome. Supervisor Zaragoza, thank you. And just to let the board know, I'm sure we'll get updates as we move ahead with this work under the Gold Coast. Earl has had to do some hiring of a significant support team to help him. We've had certainly the interest in moving ahead quickly to form our Community Advisory Council to work with the Gold Coast plan and to do the outreach that's necessary to serve the population. We have great partners at the table with us, with St. John's and Clinicus. And I'm probably missing someone, but certainly our entire system is supported as a system. So I appreciate and look forward to our work together. Thank you for coming in this morning. Thank you, Chair Long. Thank you. Okay, Margo Griswold. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to speak this morning on this great Thanksgiving week. And I'm thankful for being in a country that allows me to come and speak to the decision makers. I'm a homeowner on Koningstein Road, 12138 Koningstein. And I'm speaking on an issue that may come up before the board for a conditional use permit for a wedding venue in our community. Our community is open space residential. We live in a high fire, very high fire zone. This CUP is completely out of character with our community. 
in reviewing the Ojai Valley area plan, of which the upper Ojai Valley and our road is part, it states repeatedly the plan is to preserve, protect the character of the valley and ensure and maintain the quality of life for its residents. And I believe um, other of my neighbors have spoken to you previously. I won't take too much of your time, but I would like to speak to my concern, which is mainly safety. This venue is slated to be at the top of a cul-de-sac. Currently, the road narrows for half of the mile and a half to this venue to a less than 14 feet in some places. This is not standard. The county, I believe, the staff has not given this adequate um, assessment. If you consider that for 30 weekends, of 52, that's over half the weekends in our neighborhood, at least 250 people would be coming up each of those events. Approximately 138 to 150 cars up to a cul-de-sac in the middle of Chaparral in a high, very high fire zone. I don't have to tell you that every day is a fire season now that fires are generally caused by people. They will be allowed in their permit to have smoking areas at this venue. I don't think that people that come from the city understand how fast a fire can start in Chaparral. This concerns me. Concerns me for my own safety in possible evacuation to have over 138 cars trying to come down from a cul-de-sac when me and my neighbors are trying to evacuate animals, children, and ourselves. To say nothing of the horror and panic that 250 people would undergo and possibly worse. As a taxpayer, if the county approves such a CUP, and county council probably could speak to this better than I, wouldn't we also be at risk of lawsuits to any damage that may occur or loss of life, in fact? Ms. Griswold, your time is up. I um, appreciate your comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Ernest Stein. Good evening, Madam Chair. My, my name is Ernest Stein. Um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, you guys for your hard work and dedication to uh, not only the residents of uh, Ventura County, but also the employees of Ventura County. Um, the reason why I'm here to, uh, this morning is to announce the third annual Oxnard Tamale Festival taking place in downtown Plaza Park December 4th uh, during the same time as the Oxnard Christmas Parade. And this is a very unique event because what we're trying to do is not only promote small business, we're also trying to promote charity. And this year, what we'd like to announce is um, in our eating contest, we'll be um, inviting eight nonprofits to compete amongst each other to see who can eat the most tamales in a minute. You know, and, and those nonprofits this year are the following Arc of Ventura County, Oxnard Police Activities League. Coalition to End Family Violence, Goldswing's Children's Art Museum, Food Share of Ventura County, Community Action of Ventura County, American Cancer Society, and Salvation Army. And as you notice, we're trying to cover the wide range of charitable um, nonprofits in our community and our county um, so we can create that community awareness um, to help replenish their resources for Christmas. As you know, they're going to be deplenished for Thanksgiving. And um, I'm glad that this morning that you guys were able to give a resolution to Bonnie Weigel of FoodShare, as FoodShare is a partner of ours this year as we're trying to promote the Tackle Hunger campaign so we can replenish those food pantries for Christmas. Um, another partner of ours that are in the audience this morning is SCIU721, 
Quill graciously enough to not only sponsor us at this event, but will also be taking part so they can help in any way that they can. And so we appreciate their participation and support. So I welcome all the uh, board members and staff to come out and participate at this year's event again, December 4th, in Plaza Park from 9 to 5.30. And uh, what I also want to do before I close is we have a very special guest taking, um, be making an appearance at our event. His name is Miles Brown. For those who don't know who Miles Brown is, he's a five years old young man who participated in America's Got Talent and was a semi-finalist in this competition. So out of tens of thousands of entries in this national televised competition, he placed in the top 54. So I hope that uh, this board and uh, community members can come out and give their support to this young man as he uh, continues to be a bright light in our community. Um, at this point, Madam Chair, I'd like to present some of our event posters to the uh, uh, board members at this time. Thank you, Mr. Stein. Madam Chair, I'd like to also commend uh, Ernie for the Tamale Festival. Ernie started off uh, donating those monies to City Corn. I remember that uh, a couple of years ago, and, and you've done a good job you know, raising money for, for other organizations, and I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you, Supervisor. And as you know, uh, City Corn is a, is a um, very good organization, and this county has done a lot to uh, provide services and resources to that uh, cause, and uh, I look forward to your continued participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next up, Rosemary Sepulveda. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Rosemary Sepulveda. I am a junior at Pacifica High School. I am enrolled in the Health Science Academy and in the Redshirt Program at St. John's Hospital in Oxnard. Um, I am the granddaughter of Grace Sepulveda, a Ventura County employee since 2000. <laughs> um, when my grandmother speaks of her employees, or her coworkers, excuse me, um, she speaks of them as her family. And it seems to me like the county employees help each other out and are there for each other. My grandmother and her coworkers are very committed to what they do, and I have agreed to come here today to deliver you a Thanksgiving Day card with messages from some of the Ventura County employees. The workers are sharing from their heart, and I hope you take the time to read their notes. These workers are extremely committed to what they do and have helped the county out earlier this year. I hope, can, I hope you can figure out a way to help them with their health insurance. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, Ruben Moritz. You spoke very well, thank you. Good morning, Good morning supervisors. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Ruben Juarez, and I am a member of the Ventura County Bargaining Committee representing almost 4,000 SEIU 721 members. I work for the Ventura County Health Care Plan, and I help thousands of families find affordable health care for their children. I began, I, I love being able to help people provide with health care for their families. But today, I am here to express my concerns about the increase of health care rates that all county employees will be receiving starting in January. There was a time when the negotiated county flex credit coverage covered the lowest cost family plan, but not any longer. I think of my coworkers as my second family and I must speak up for them today. Please allow me a moment to share a story about a Ventura County Medical Center housekeeper named Eva Gonzalez. A few years ago, Eva and her husband moved to Bakersfield because they could not afford a home on their own salaries in Ventura County. Eva commutes almost 200 miles each day for four hours Eva saves her accrued time off to use just in case the grapevine closes because of bad weather. So with that, she will almost lose any pay and rarely use them for vacation. 
because of health reasons, Eva's husband is no longer working, and because they live outside the Ventura County, they cannot access the lowest cost health care plan options. Out of Eva's $2,000 salary, $2, salary, she pays the mortgage, groceries, $300 in gas for, uh, for the commute and, of the necess and other necessities of life for herself and her husband and her three sons. The increased premiums are a hardship for her. Earlier this year, SEIU 721 members began contributing more to their retirement, which has helped save the county over $6 million. We are not asking for pay increase. We are simply asking to stop our paychecks from eroding. The extra $19 per paycheck will greatly ease the strain and the strain of many Ventura County families feel, and it will help Eva with another tank of gas. Thank you, Mr. Juarez. Thank you. Carolyn Consotti. Good morning, Madam Chair and Supervisors. I'm Carolyn Consoli. I work for Public Health Tobacco Education Department. I'm also part of the bargaining team and a union steward. I absolutely love my job. We get to help people quit using tobacco products. So if anybody needs to quit using tobacco products, you can talk to me. Um, it's a great program, and I get a lot of joy out of being able to help the public. It's in my heart, and I'm a public servant. Um, Last year, our members agreed to what amounted to a 3% pay cut to help the county make it through a difficult budget year. We also once absorbed higher health care premiums, which effectively reduced our take-home pay even more. As a result, many Ventura County employees are hurting living paycheck to paycheck, family budget stressed and strained to the breaking point. And we know that this is an ongoing story. Um, there was a point where I lost my driver's license and... Um, I actually couldn't afford to get a new one after this increase of my contributions. So that was only $25. So another $19 um, out of my paycheck is going to greatly hurt me. So I'm already bouncing around which bills I can pay, which bills I can't, how long I have. As many of my, my fellow members are, the lowest paid employees. So I'll be bringing home about $820 every two weeks. And um, it's not because of lack of education. I'm about halfway through my master's in public health. Um, so that's really important to take into consideration because I'm not the only one. Earlier this year, um, the city of Ventura completed a compensation study in which compared total compensation packages of municipal employers in the Ventura County labor market, including the cities of Camarillo, Simi Valley, Oxnard, Thousand Oaks, Ventura, Santa Barbara, as well as the counties of Ventura and Santa Barbara. Thirteen benchmark classifications were included in this study. In almost every case, the county of Ventura ranks dead last with the lowest compensation packages of any of the municipalities, um, well below the, uh, the labor um, market averages. Like me, most Ventura County employees love their job and are gratified to contribute to public services for our community. But sometimes they need a little bit help, a little help too. As you know, we are not asking for raises, but we know that our health care premiums will increase again in a few months. Without an increase in the county's contribution, Ventura County employees will take home even smaller paychecks next year. This would be the third reduction in, in take-home pay within the span of one year. All we are asking is that your board not walk away with your past commitment to families, including helping your employees offset the impact of constantly rising health care costs. Our union has proposed that the county contribute enough to at least cover the least expensive health care plans. The cost of this proposal would be roughly $1.4 million. The general fund from the general fund, roughly the same amount that the board approved earlier this year for improvements to the county horse trails. We understand that the money for the horse, horse trails came from a different source. Carolyn, can you wrap up? Okay, sorry. Um, and cannot be used for employee family health coverage, but still when the county can find money for horse trails but not our health care, well, there's something wrong with this picture. The county must not always make its employees the lowest priority. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, we have Isabel Rubalcaba. Isabel? 
Good morning. Good morning. Hello, my name is Isabel Valcava. I'm a resident of Ventura and medical office assistant at West Ventura VCMC Satellite Clinic Urgent Care. I'm very thankful that I have worked as a healthcare professional in the healthcare industry for six years. Last week, we received a notice from Ventura County Council that Ventura County does not recognize the partnership between medical doctors and Ventura County. It also does not recognize VCMC Satellite Clinic as a public entity. We are 12 health clinics affiliated with Ventura County. Majority of VCMC Satellite workers agree that having a union can increase better environment at work and benefit our community. We want to be recognized as a union for us to be able to negotiate a contract with our medical director and Ventura County as our joint employer. Being recognized as a union with the right leadership can improve our work area, better training, wages, equal rights, teamwork, better health care for our families, and most important, being allowed to have someone represent us when we are called to the office for a sort of disciplinary action. We want to be acknowledged for the work and duties we provide for the Ventura County. Not having a union can jeopardize our patients and staff members. As an employee, we have the right to form a union with the right employers. We enjoy our jobs, and this is the way to secure fair wages, proper communication, and fair treatment for ourselves, for our clinics, and for our patients. Our daily jobs include from working the county system to helping diversity of people in our community, including our own family members. We follow, we follow county procedures and regulations daily. Our employee orientation is facilitated by employee HR. We use Ventura County badges and the list goes on and on. What I'm asking is to take the time to analyze all the reasons we have provided to you why we should be recognized as a union with the joint employer and in hope that you can realize that this partnership is needed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Samantha Aguilar. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, my name is Samantha Aguilar. I live in Oxnard. I am 11 years old and my mom is a medical assistant at the West Ventura Medical Clinic. I use the clinic only when I am really sick because we can't afford health insurance, health coverage for me, so my mom makes sure that I am extra careful when I play at home. I am thankful that my mom can provide me with the best that she can. I hope that she can get the best at work too because it's a lot of family and friends that go to her for help. I try to help my mom at fairs and meetings, but I hope that you can also help her too. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Okay, um, next up, um, Francisco Aguilar. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. My name is Francisco Aguilar. My mother is Sylvia Aguilar. She has been a medical assistant at West Ventura Medical Clinic for five years. Even though my mother works at a clinic, I do not have health insurance. I am also a patient of West Ventura Medical Clinic. My mom took me to urgent care after I stepped on a bee and it caused serious pain on my foot. My, that trip to urgent care cost my family $75. My mom and her coworkers deserve proper health benefits for our family, friends, and community. Please do not delay the union recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Rosalinda Varela. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, my name is Rosalinda Varela. My mother is Elsa Fernandez. A medical assistant at West Ventura Clinic for nine years, eight years, I'm sorry. I am 13 years old and I receive care from West Ventura and Mandalay Bay Clinic. Even though my mother is a medical assistant, I don't have health care insurance. I am covered through healthy families. And I am sure many other clinic workers with children have the same problem. My mom and I have never had an easy life through her brain tumor in 2007 and our bankruptcy that we're going through right now. My mom has been strong. But my mom has never been the one to stand up and say no. That's why I'm extremely proud of my mom for going through this and standing up for what she believes in. Delaying their union recognition 
is hurting VCMC healthcare. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Giovanni Aguilar? Giovanna. Gio I'm sorry, Giovanna. There isn't a there. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Giovanna Aguilar. My mother is Sylvia Aguilar. She's a medical assistant at West Ventura Medical Clinic. But even though my mother works at a clinic, we do not have health insurance. Um, the last time I went for a routine doctor's visit was over two years ago. Um, that means that a routine doctor's visit requires saving money and it takes time. Last year, I almost lost my vision to corneal ulcers. <clears throat> I was very lucky even though I had to wait a whole month before getting treatment. My siblings and I, and I are very limited on any kind of out outdoor activities because my mom is very scared of us getting hurt. I don't like being limited at 17. <laughs> and I don't want my mom to be so stressed about medical expenses. My mom and her co-workers are hardworking residents of this community, and they deserve health coverage and a chance to shape their workplace through union contract. For our family, friends, and community, please do not delay um, their union recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Edie Brown. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Edie Brown, and I'm regional director for the California Congress of, of Seniors. Uh, I'm here to address today the problem of uh, union for the clinic workers. The Congress of California Seniors is a statewide nonprofit organization and that has for more than 40 years been a strong voice for millions of California seniors. As an umbrella organization for more than 100 affiliated groups, uh, CCS serves combined membership of several hundred thousand Californians. As seniors, we put our faith and the trust in the health care we receive from the Ventura County uh, Center Clinics. Many of us are on fixed incomes and access to affordable public clinics is extremely <coughs> important. Unfortunately, many of us, including myself, have observed and heard stories of shortcuts taken at the clinics, shortcuts that affect our health. We have experienced incidents of inadequate supplies, equipment malfunctions, and extremely long time wait times uh, caused by inadequate staffing. I've personally experienced having uh, an aide go through three pieces of equipment before she could take my blood pressure, which I thought was uh, totally inadequate. Based on what we have seen at the main VCMC clinic, we are confident the workers of the VCMC satellite clinics have our interests at heart. We seek to improve conditions at the clinics through a union contract, and that in turn will improve the quality of health care that we seniors uh, receive at the clinics. For these reasons, the California Congress of Seniors asks the Madam Chair, Supervisor Kathy Long, and the members of the Board of Supervisors direct the County Human Resources Department to follow the law and process the VCMC satellite clinic workers' petition for union recognition. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown, for your comments. Okay, that completes all of the speaker cards. Did I miss anyone? Anyone who had submitted? Oh, please come forward. If, um, oh, you're on item 47? Okay. Oh, no. We'll, uh, we'll be right to that. Um, just, just a minute. Okay. Um, all right. Well, then, thank you, all of you who did come in to speak to us this morning. We appreciate hearing from you and your comments. Thank you. Okay, board members. Um, we're going to move ahead now at this time to board comments. Um, and I should have brought that other thing up, but I didn't. Okay. Who would like to go first? Supervisor Foy. I see you're ready. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a couple things. First, I'd like to adjourn memory of the people on this list. I know it's always difficult during the holiday seasons when you put a list with people on that. Um, a couple things. When I first got elected, we uh, started a uh, 118 task force over on the 118, and it's, it seemed to work pretty well. We've seen a lot of reductions. i got to compliment the Highway Patrol and all the hard work they've done. 
and um, our own roads people and, and the sheriff's department. So it's worked out well. But also you probably re read that the uh, CHP also got uh, some funding, additional funding, about $212,000. And which is going to add an awful lot of hours, about 1,800 hours on the road. You know, it's one of Ventura County's uh, most deadly roads. And so I am excited to see that go on and to see people, uh, lives being changed by the less accidents that were there. The other thing I'd like to say is that uh, <clears throat> sometimes up here we talk about a lot of the difficult situations we deal with in the state and budgets and all that. And during Thanksgiving, though, when you we had somebody up here speak about that we're in this country, that we're in a country that we can come up and speak, and that we are very blessed to be able to enjoy the freedoms that we have. And even though things may be difficult and, and, and tough in a lot of ways for a lot of us, but we still have so many blessings um, in this country. And I just want to say during this Thanksgiving holiday season that we should make sure we really do focus on that. not the negative side, but the blessings of family and friends and the community and the place we live. So I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Supervisor Parks. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to close in honor of the people on this list and, and call out two individuals. Uh, one is Bonnie uh, Wiley, who is the mother of Steve Wiley and uh, our Reckon Rec Park District um, manager. And I know that she will be very much missed. And also a, a, a lady named Anna Joes. And Anna was... Um, the first president of the Oxnard Chamber of Commerce when she uh, started, uh, where she started the Oxnard um, Police Canine Program. And uh, she's also, she served on the Oxnard City Council from 1985 to 1990, and also was a board member of the California Department of Mining and Geology. And she was, uh, uh, she is also the mother of John Joes of um, Santa Rosa Valley. and. He continues in her footsteps. He has been very involved in uh, helping to get that uh, new bridge uh, through, through citizens' efforts to put in a bridge for equestrians, so that's nice. Um, I also want to wish everyone a, a wonderful Thanksgiving. Um, last night at the um, Triumph Sanitation District Board, I was very thankful to have it be my last meeting and have it turned over to um, elected representatives instead of, uh, as I was, an appointed representative. Uh, we had 11 people run for that position and uh, got a great new board, people that I think are actually uh, probably more qualified than what was there. Instead of uh, like a dentist and a police officer, we have water engineers and managers and risk, uh, risk analysis folks. And so I'm looking forward to seeing uh, that, that grow and, and getting uh, some good representation for people who deserve it. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Zarago. And congratulations on yeah. pulling that change off. You worked at yeah. that for years, right? Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, and also, I, I'd like, like to uh, adjourn in memory of this my constituents on, on this list. And I didn't realize that Anna Jones had passed away. And, uh, I remember she was a council member in Oxnard when I was an employee in the city of Oxnard. Oh. Yeah, so my condolences to her family, too. Uh, I'd also like to uh, report that uh, last week, and I was gone, and I'll share a little bit about uh, the CSAC, but uh, while I was gone, you know, my staff, you know, was very instrumental in, in attending uh, meetings for me, like, for example, the housing for people with disabilities, land use and zoning and civil rights law. They also attended the annual volunteer award ceremony at the, at the JJC, and also the uh, awards over at the Senior Center in Oxnard in the Colonial Center, and also the El Rio ribbon cutting ceremony in Nyland with a new um, building that we have there and family services for our youth in, in Nyland Acres. And also they attended the state uh, correction youth facility monthly meeting, so while I was gone, you know, they, they were taking care of business. And I appreciate that. <laughs> and I also, you know, signed up for CSAC, but uh, unfortunately, uh, when I was at CSAC, I, I got a call from uh, from my uh, sister that my mother was very ill over in Madera, California, so I had to leave. But I did attend uh, a couple of the sessions, the kickoff uh, session there at CSAC in Riverside, and they were setting the stage for the rest of the week. I attended a couple of workshops before I left, and one was the Housing and Land Use and Transportation Policy uh, Committee, and they spoke about the future funding of transportation and the modes of transportation for California, and also a comprehensive look at those modes of transportation. 
and also an update on 375. SB 375 was talked about a little bit too. And one of the uh, presentations that I really enjoyed was a presentation by a gentleman by the name of Neil Peterson. His uh, whole idea was no barriers, only solutions. And he, uh, Neil, shared some of his uh, personal uh, examples on how he uh, overcame a surmountable uh, barriers uh, that he had. It was uh, what he called perceived disadvantages he turned to advantages. And he was the first black man, he was born in South Africa, that sailed around the world in a yacht that he built himself. He traveled 27,000 miles in, in nine months. And uh, he proved uh, to himself and the rest of the world that could be done. And what he did when he was sharing his examples, he was sharing on how we as policymakers have to do things that are very difficult. And using the disadvantages to our advantages is extremely important. It was a great, great presentation that he did. And also, during the short time that I was CSAC, then I also attended another class. And uh, this individual, this teacher, Michael Steinberg from uh, Pomona Academic High School, spoke about actually, let me back up a little bit. He motivated uh, six or seven Latino kids, I think is what it was, to share their experiences about what's happening at home, what's happening with the foreclosures, with uh, not enough food at, at home, and, and this. Seven Latino kids spoke, and, 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 and the uh, essence was just anybody listening is what they were sharing. They did such a great job that actually uh, this video was um, um, President Obama got a hold of it and, and commended the, the teacher and the kids for all the good work they were doing. And this one video, it's a nine minute video, has been sent around the world for uh, over 140 million people have seen it. And this kid started from nothing, from zero. They were supposedly losers, and now they're going to medical school at UCLA. They're, they're attorneys or individuals that have done really great uh, work, all Latino kids and, and one uh, black little girl. Excellent job, uh, excellent presentation that he did. Uh, and also the other one uh, that I attended was, uh, um, let me back up a little bit. The one gal by the name of Jennifer Gill was one of the leaders of that Latino group, and she really made an excellent, excellent presentation. And one of the messages that she sent was, um, it says, um, the voice is your power. And use it, speak out, and people will listen. It was really, really great. And also there was another class that I attended, and that was on pension reform and also uh, public retirements and, and uh, pension spiking and, and those kind of issues that, that are extremely important. And of course, you know, the, for the, the Board of Supervisors and all the policymakers, there's a new Forum 700 coming out for, um, it's called the uh, Addendum G to the Forum 700 that, uh, that, t that they talked about. And, and right now it's optional, and I'm sure that the legislature is going to work on that and, and probably make it uh, mandatory that uh, in the future that we, uh, that we use that Form 700 Addendum G. So then I left to Madeira and didn't complete the, uh, the CSAC. But during the time that I was there, I'd like to share that our uh, supervisor, our chair, Kathy Long, has been with CSAC for years and years representing the, the county of Ventura and doing an excellent job in making policy, legislation, and so forth. And she got this award that I'd like to, to share with the rest of the board and the public. And it's called the 2010 Circle of Service Award. And this is, was uh, given to Kathy Long, Ventura County Supervisor by CSAC, California State Association of Counties. And this is a beautiful award that she gave for all the good work she's done for the community, and I'd like to, to share that with you. Ben Chen. She was too modest. She didn't want to share that. <laughs> So anyway, I'm, it was a very uh, productive week, not only by myself, and by the way, my mother's doing great. She's only going to be 91 here in a couple of months, and so, so thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing the CSAC with me. I really <laughs> appreciate it. It was Absolutely. great to have you there, as long as you could, and happy to hear about your mother doing yes. much better. Thank you.
Supervisor Bennett. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, also happy to hear about your mother uh, thank you. being better. It's nice of you to share that uh, word with Supervisor uh, uh, Long. Um, I'd also like to address the comments we, we heard from uh, uh, our SEIU uh, employees uh, out there. Um, a couple of messages that I think are important and one, uh, particularly somebody describing the challenges of living in Bakersfield, commuting here, trying to make it on that kind of income. Um, uh, you know, the challenges are real. In this economy, there are so many people that are hurting and, 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 and uh, I want you to know, uh, I and we recognize it is tough uh, out there. Uh, to try to make it in this this economy at, at this point in time, so it's not something that uh, that we take lightly or are not uh, not conscious of uh, in terms of that. The other thing that I uh, want to want to be clear on, I think we've consistently said that uh, uh, we're going to make sure that. Uh, uh, but however we treat uh, the people that we call our unclassified employees, those are, those are not unionized, um, that that's the same way that, that includes our managers and our management employees, people that are, you know, clerical people in, in managers' offices, et cetera. Uh, we're going to treat SEIU the same, and that's been a commitment we've had for a long time, and I'm, I'm sure that's a commitment that's going to go forward. So um, there's not, uh, there's not going to be a benefit for, you know, management employees that's not going to happen to SEIU employees. So just wanted to get those two things out there. And the third thing, I've said it the last two times, but I'll say it again as we have people talking about our clinic workers, and that is um, I see the benefits of unionization, of collective bargaining. Uh, I think that they are there. The question is uh, from a county's perspective. Um, we recognize that, the, that there are some many benefits if it can happen, but the question is who is it that the collective bargaining and the unionization should take place with? Should it be with the clinic uh, providers or should it be with the county? That's the legal question that is, is being determined out there. So I appreciate the comments, and I just want people to know that um, uh, we know it's tough uh, tough out there in this holiday season in, in particular. I'd like to ask the board to adjourn in memory of uh, Mike Powers' mother. And uh, she passed away, um, and fortunately for the Powers family, she was surrounded by the whole family uh, at the time. And it's been a really tough year for Mike and his family. Uh, he lost his brother this year, and now his uh, his mother. And uh, I know we wish them all well, and know that uh, you you have to hope that these kind of times pull a family closer together, and that that's one more contribution that you're relatives make as they, as they pass on, is, is, is pulling everybody uh, tighter together. And also during the memory of the other people on this list, um, I'd also like to uh, point out I attended the uh, November 11th uh, Veterans Day uh, uh, services at the Ivy Lawn uh, Memorial, um, and um, uh, I, they're going to try to, I think, upgrade those services and really make that a, a real focal point in the county for the county in the future. And there's some interesting things going on at, uh, at Ivy Lawn. Uh, Saturday morning, I attended the uh, League of Women Voters Homeless Forum um, uh, down in uh, Camarillo. And um, uh, that was certainly a, a good forum, bringing people together and, 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 and trying to clarify where things are with that issue. Uh, they pointed out uh, certainly the funding that the board has made available to build a homeless shelter, reminded everybody about that out in the county. And hopefully something will happen this year uh, with that. Uh, on uh, Saturday, I also attended the Ojai Community Hospital uh, Ninth Annual Nightingale Ball. And uh, it's just one of the cool things that there's only, this is the only county, I'm certain, in the country that has seen the revival of two small hospitals, uh, the Ojai Community Hospital and Santa Paula Hospital. One county run, one privately run. I think just really a great sign of what's happening here. But uh, that event raised $130,000 for the Ojai Community Hospital. They, they, they did a really nice job. Uh, I also attended uh, uh, on Friday the uh, Boy Scout Annual Distinguished Citizen Dinner, and uh, Supervisor Foy was there. Um, had an opportunity to buy uh, two different things that are good for family things, but we're going to go to the uh, Boy Scout camp up there with 24 people and uh, um, and uh, do the rock climbing and, and, and all of that. But uh, it's a very good fundraiser for boys, uh, for the Boy Scout organization. And, and, uh, 
then um, this Thursday, uh, for those of you that are in the city of Ventura, I invite you this Thursday to come down to the One City, One Meal event. Um, they're going to be serving meals at 11, 12, uh, and 1, uh, and it'll be at the Knights of Columbus. And this is not a we serve the homeless meals. This is we all as a community sit down and eat a meal together. And uh, I think it's a much uh, much more appropriate atmosphere for for us if you want to provide food or, or if you want to come and share a meal with uh, with, with uh, others in the community. Uh, we certainly invite you to do that. Donations of food items are still needed and volunteers are st still needed. And for more information, you can call NOLA. Uh, and that's at 659-3598. So if you're interested, I'm going to repeat that number. NOLA at 659-3598 to either set up on Thursday morning. You can do it in any, any shifts that you want. You can set up Thursday morning before the event. You can help serve at the event. Um, and it will start at 11 o'clock. Um, and thank you very much for uh, the time to make these uh, comments. Thank you. I'd like to share one more thing that uh, Supervisor Bender reminded me of. And my staff has really uh, worked with them too. Is uh, Casa Lopez over in Oxnard, at um, right about the 300 block of South A Street. At 11 o'clock today, they're going to be serving uh, free turkey uh, lunches. So anybody that wants to go out there. Last year, I think Casa Lopez served almost 500 uh, servings. So my staff has been working with Casa Lopez. So if uh, if you want to have uh, some turkey dinner, you can go over to Casa Lopez today, starting at about 11 o'clock, over at 300 South A Street. I just wanted to share that too for, for information. Okay, thank you, um, board members. And uh, first, I'd like to submit this list uh, to adjourn in memory of folks in the third district. Um, also, to thank our speakers for coming in this morning. Uh, it's always important to hear from you. Um, having just attended the CSAC uh, conference, also, um, let me say this: I think. Our county is in better position than most, but we're all facing some very tough, tough conditions ahead of us for the next couple of years. At the conference, we heard from the Legislative Analyst Office. We heard from Daryl Steinberg's Chief of Staff. Um, we heard from many professionals up and down the state who are challenged with um, uh, providing both the services and programs that we're all committed to, particularly in this county, for the health and welfare support, uh, that safety net. Um, and we're all facing significant challenges when it comes to providing that health care, um, not just for our employees, but for those who in the county need, who are uninsured totally, um, that, that safety net that we historically have done so well in providing services. Um, no question that the pension obligations up and down the state are, are tremendous um, uh, challenges for counties, um, this county certainly being one, but some counties to the point of short of um, the not being able to declare bankruptcy, they would. Um, so it's, it's tough times, and, and the forecasts are, are going to be challenging for the next couple of years. Uh, it was good to hear some news this morning uh, on the local radio talking about some uh, reported growth in um, uh, the retail sector and some, you know, uh, of course, the stock market wasn't doing well, but uh, there are some ticks of prosperity or, or at least hope that we're seeing in the market and the economy, um, but we're, we're all facing a tough years in front of us. Um, and the work with the, um, and it was good to, to be at CSAC to one hear from other counties uh, best practices um, and, and listen to what they're doing to get through the tough times. Um, always looking to where, learn where we can and share where we can. And, and again, I think our county is, is one of the leaders in um, best practices, but there's always room to look at another program and look at how we could deliver services differently. Um, one of the policy committees I always participate in is Administration Justice Policy Committee. And there is a report that will be released soon. Um, the near final report is referred to it. And it's regarding uh, criminal justice collaboration on mental health issues. And that report is supposed to come out the first of the year. And this was a statewide task force that was um, pulled together both by um, the counties and the state 
leadership. So it will be interesting to see um, what some of the recommendations um, that come out of that work. And some of, as I always do with, with CSAC, I will be pulling together specific um, uh, policy reports and things that came out of the committees and provide to all of you so you can look and see what areas of interest you may have and follow up. Um, it, um, that was probably the key one on the Justice Policy Council. The government finance and operations, uh, clearly we were talking about um, the challenges with uh, uh, obligations for pension uh, obligations and uh, cost of doing business um, and the fact that we have uh, now a very, um, because of voter initiatives, we have both Prop 22 and um, 24 that have given us some convoluted pathways that we have to work our way through related to commitments made in this last fiscal year that still roll over for the until July of next year related to gas swap monies and VLF monies and how we're going to sort through um, just addressing the um, uh, um, revenue streams that come to the counties uh, or don't come to the counties uh, as a result of, of that both the initiatives and the prior commitments in, made in this budget let alone what we're going to be facing and it's you know now we all know that new figure is 25 billion dollar deficit um, for the state over the next 18 months potential of, an, of a special election that may be called by the new governor to try and uh, sort out some of what uh, has become very entangled um, both in legislation and initiatives um, so we will be hearing more on that, working our way through that. Um, and the Government and Finance Operations Committee, uh, we, we talked about um, also the complications that are going to roll out from Prop 14, which is California's top two primary. Complications related to the cost of implementing that and who's going to carry that cost and how it's going to be implemented and challenges yet to come from that. Um, our pension update, there was a total separate workshop and the supervisor there goes to talk about and I know some of our staff attended just focus on the pension. Um, they're, they're, uh, you know, they're projecting some increased obligation uh, anywhere from 30% on up for pension obligations for some counties across the state. Um, and, yeah, and the next, yeah, yeah. Um, and again, I will provide some of this as I, I sort through it. Um, the value of CSAC is, is always to be able to uh, learn from others and share uh, best practices. Um, it was, it was um, great to have our sheriff-elect uh, attend. Don't know that I've seen representation from uh, um, that level, certainly, in the past. And, very engaged in um, policy discussions in government finance and criminal justice. So it was good to have our sheriff-elect there um, and certainly other uh, management team leaders in our county were present and participating. So, um, and, and my service uh, circle of services, you stick around long enough and work on enough task force, you get a lovely paperweight that I do treasure. <laughs> Madam Chair, yes. I, if I could, I just want to point one thing out, and for the benefit of, of our employees that are all potentially listening to this, but you, know, you, you mentioned that some counties have a 30 percent increase in their yeah. in their contribution. Um, all of our employees need to know that one of the challenges we have is that without our revenues going up, we have uh, a 3 percent increase to pay for everybody's increased pension costs next year that we're trying to absorb. So, uh, so in, in some sense, uh, people should view that there, there are the total compensation for employees in Ventura County is going to go up by 3% next year. It's just you're not going to see it in your paychecks because we have to pay it into the pension fund. So that's an additional, we're, we're challenged to try to come up with. That's, uh, uh, I think, about $20 million next year that we have to come up with for all employees to pay the increased pension uh, mm -hmm. pension contribution. So anyway, as you talk about it, it could be a lot worse if, uh, if it was other counties that had uh, contributed uh, quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, as you, as you talked about at CSAC and stuff. Uh, you, you, do, you, do you know which counties are the ones that are in much worse shape? Do you have the names of those counties by any chance? I can't tell you. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I didn't make the list. Great. All right. There, there, were, um, there was no question, and I've probably heard more of it in the pension task force. 
work uh, subcommittee. So right. um, okay. I don't, but um, there is discussion by CSAC of pulling together uh, that kind of information, right. but also to look at um, uh, pull together. One of the, the things we're all hearing is transparency and in, in, um, salaries and compensation, and looking at is there a way we could uh, CSAC could have a role in doing a, um, a statewide pulling together of that information and making that available to you. But it, it, is, it is almost a, I mean, it's certainly a cost increase for the county, whether it's, yes. viewed, whether it's viewed as a pay increase for an employee, it's a cost increase for the county, the, the increased pension cost, and we're certainly yeah. trying to absorb it and, and not ask our employees to do it. Thank you. Madam Chair, you know, I also want to thank Marty and our staff that was here, you know, attending the CSAC. I think it's so important to, to get that education and see what other counties are doing. And, mm -hmm. And I want to thank okay. you for being there, for attending. And I also see Dave, you know, we were talking about the junta dollars, you know, the uh, 17.3 cents, you know, with the uh, the gas money, you know, for our roads and and so forth, you know, and how are we going to keep those, those those dollars is very important to you. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to thank staff for being there, too. Even okay. though I was only there for a couple of sessions. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, board? Okay. We had, uh, and I'll, I'm going to uh, invite her to come up, Lynn Olson um, had put a card in to speak on an item that's been continued, but she's here and she would like to speak to that, so I'll certainly ask her to come forward to do so, even though it has been continued for, as you know, for two weeks. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Lynn Olson, and I'd uh, like to uh, say good morning to um, all of the Board of Supervisors. Um, my actual comments are were from the public comments, because when I initially went on the website, I thought the issue of the contract being approved for telecare was on this day's agenda, but apparently it's been, uh, it won't be um, on the agenda till December. So um, this is in regards to that, okay. <laughs> not item. 47 as originally. So that was my confusion and I apologize. Uh, my name is Lynn Olson. I am Chris, Chris's mom and I'm a 40 year resident of Ventura County, having attended Cal Lutheran and graduating with a master's degree in 1999. My son has schizoaffective disorder and being helped by behavioral health. This eight year journey has been difficult for me if not for the support of NAMI. My brief comments are in response to the awarding of the MHRTF to Telecare. The RFP committee had opinions of desiring a new company to run the residential portion of this program, and yet their votes went to contracts committee where Telecare was selected. An assumption by a few of my associates stated that Telecare was a larger establishment and able to show financial backing for six months. My son lived at Casa Esperanza twice. He has his challenges but it gave me an opportunity to witness many unethical practices and unstructured approaches to dealing with mentally ill persons. I saw drugs. I saw 911 calls to the facility, a psychotic gentleman running around without any notice by staff, an autistic man who was starving to death, who was starving, needing, needing special eating arrangements while also went unnoticed. There was a death, evictions by many loved ones of NAMI parents, there was increased drug use with no means of intervention, and there was no accountability by telecare to behavioral health until now. Even with this accountability, which is so um, wonderfully run um, under the supervision of Melanie Roy, I feel that telecare should not be awarded this contract. This last piece of Camarillo State Hospital of under 100 consumers should be run by an evidence-based company to match the beauty of its facility. The damage done for over five years to these mentally ill loved ones is over, but I question the county's decision to ultimately award this contract to them again. Why would this county not want pristine services to match its beauty? I realize things will definitely change now with ANCA running Hillmont House due to their new security systems, yet I wish you would can reconsider the thoughts and votes of the RFP committee, especially from the ANCA and the NAMI representatives. They desired a new company for many of the reasons that I'm stating today. In conclusion, mental illness will not go away and it strikes mostly the 18 to 25 year old population. If we ignore their cries for help, we will continue to participate in the anguish from which those cries for help come. 
This problem is magnitude, and we cannot turn our backs. Telecare turned their backs too many times, and I ask you to please reconsider accepting their contract. Thank you for All listening. Right. Thank you, Ms. Olson. Thank you. And again, that will be heard at a future date. Uh, but your comments are noted in the sure for the public record. That's appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I just or? comment. I, I have spoke with uh, Ms. Olson too, and just that uh, at least one of the things that we'll be able to do is provide different providers for treatment at the Cass Esperanza, and that will help too. So we won't just be limited to telecare. So that's a good change to that contract. But I do appreciate your input. I know uh, NAMI members sat on the, the uh, RFP review committee, but it does uh, point to the fact that we do need more competition in that field. Thank yes. you. Okay, thank you. All right, board members, I was remiss in talking about our agenda earlier, but I would like to um, take uh, the opportunity to, because we have um, uh, a public member here on item 48, which is our animal services request. Uh, we're going to hear that item now. If we could. I invite up Monica Nolan, our director of animal services. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Monica Nolan, Animal Services, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mrs. Robinson. Um, before you is a uh, recommendation to accept a donation for $70,000 and to approve the naming of a community cat room. The donation is for the building of a community cat room at our animal shelter. And um, the donation is coming from our um, nonprofit, ARVA, but in reality, the largest portion of that donation is coming from a single donor, uh, Mrs. Sharon Miller. And the other recommendation would be to approve the naming of the community cat room in honor of um, the major financial donor. And the name of the facility would be Miller's Kitty Cottage. And um, so, and then the third recommendation is to authorize the auditor controller to do the necessary budgetary transactions. Uh, a little bit of discussion on the item. Animal shelters are traditionally built for dogs, which uh, being a dog owner, I have no problem with that. But, um, but the way they are built um, is they're, they're built for kennels and uh, kennels with runs uh, to ha house, and house the dogs, to give the dogs the opportunity to have in inside and outside spaces. They also have pens so that you can take the dog out and be able to have an opportunity as an adopter to interact with the dog. Uh, for cats, um, the only thing that uh, traditional shelters have are cages. And there's not really much opportunity for an adopter to interact with a cat, and a cat will shut down in a cage. Uh, and uh, statistics show that adopters don't really um, um, have a chance to really see what a cat does. In our shelter last year, we had 3,800 cats go through our shelter, and only 19% of them got adopted. So it really shows that um, cats don't have much of a good chance when they run through a traditional shelter. Uh, new shelter philosophy says that you should have a space for cats that they can go out and they can mingle, they can socialize, and that an adopter can go in and mingle with those cats and really see how a cat can interact. And so that's the purpose of a community cat room. And uh, new shelters now um, are building these community cat rooms. Building takes money. And we, um, of course, don't want to go before the Board of Supervisors and ask you for building funds. So we thought, well, you know, you can always put the idea out there and see what happens. And so that's what we did. The reverse of field of dreams. If they build it, they will come. We had them, the cats. Um, so we just decided to do a reverse of that. Um, so we, uh, I had a friend that had Photoshop. I, I put up what we thought the community cat room should look like in a big poster. And we put up a little kitty jars. And we said, um, please, please donate to our kitty room. And um, a few months went by. And uh, we had some change going to our kitty room. And then one day I got a knock on the door. And this wonderful woman, Mrs. Sharon Miller, came and she said, um, excuse me, how much have you collected for that kitty room so far? <laughs> and I went and I added it up and I said, um, $7.50. Oh. And she said, well, I really believe in that kitty room and I really want to see it built before I turn 80. 
So I'm going to build that room for you. And she stepped forward, and that's when she took the ball and she ran with it. And this wonderful lady has had the plans built, has, has, has gotten an architect and, an, and a structural engineer. And by the way, she's gotten both of those wonderful men, Mr. Ben Liu and Scott Weiss, to donate their services pro bono and um, has, has um, had them had the plans done. The plans are on their way. And she has kept me going. Has, uh, we've gotten GSA involved, has kept GSA on the ball. And she's um, going, and I think that she will have it done um, by, by, well, by her 80th birthday, if nothing else. So um, <laughs> um, also, I w do want to say that this is not the only thing that Sharon has uh, done as a contribution. She uh, con contributes regularly to our pet pantry drops off uh, bags or she calls me up because she lives in Thousand Oaks and she says, Monica, I've got another load of stuff. Come on by. And I drive by and fill up my car and, and uh, go to the pet pantry. She also just contributed 60 beds to our main kennel. Um, these are uh, new dog beds. Uh, oh. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Sharon contributes to other chair to other um, uh, Rescues, uh, uh, Valley Vet nonprofit, uh, to Carl. So uh, she's a wonderful lady, and I want to bring her up and introduce her and let her speak to you. But before I do that, um, I'll answer any questions that you have. Questions from board members? Well, I'll I just want to. I just want to thank her too for for the donation. You know, I um, um, my grandson called me up because he has a cat. He has a cat, and they have a dog. So he says, now we're even. He's <laughs> so, but he loves his cat, and, 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 uh, and of course, you know, we have our, our poodle. My wife has anyway, so I just want to thank her for donating those dollars, and, and it's really going to be a great addition to your facilities there at the airport, you know, and, and, and I want to thank her for, okay. for being so kind with those animals. Madam Chair, yes. real quick, I certainly want to thank Mrs. Miller for a very generous contribution, okay. and I want to compliment you for creating a culture that's having more and more volunteers step forward and, and Monica this is just a this is just a great great addition and it's just consistent with what's happened since you've taken over so well, thank, thank you, you very much. much please okay. Ms. Miller please come forward yeah, come on up. yeah good morning good morning I am thrilled to be here um, I have wrote a little things so I didn't forget anything uh, after discovering the wonderful cat room at the Agura shelter we feel totally blessed to be able to contribute to building the community cat room at the Camarillo Shelter. We were searching for a special way to honor the memory of our daughter who died of breast cancer at age 41. Kathy Jo loved all animals and would be thrilled with this little haven for kitties awaiting a forever home. How much nicer to wait in such a room and not in a cage. The design and structural plans, as Monica said, were executed by two local professionals free of charge, and they have been so nice. I've gone to their house, pick up the first plans, took it, take them here, and then I take them back. I'm really learning my way around. <laughs> Following the GSA's estimate bid process, if the cost is higher, we will provide the additional funds. So, Arva, don't don't tell them. <laughs> well, Arva doesn't need to empty their coffers for this. This is all about saving the lives of many, many cats. And we trust with that in mind, this project will be given extreme top priority. Before you fix any holes in the streets, build the cat room, please. <laughs> okay? Do you have any questions? Thank you so much. You are an angel. That is so nice for, for the cats. And, you know, I think we really need to get this advertised when we get it built and let people come so just to see the, this wonderful kitty cottage. It's a total different atmosphere to interact Absolutely. with cats like that. And to reduce the kill rate, you know, that's, yes. that's what's going to happen as a result of your I know. funding. So thank yeah. you so much. You're and, so welcome. And it's, it's our pleasure at the board to be able to accept the donation and to name it Miller's Kitty Cottage. That's thank wonderful. Thank you. Is that a motion? I would make that a motion. Good. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second to move ahead with the Miller's Kitty Cottage <laughs> you. and your wonderful donation. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yes. Let's make, do the motion, the motion and the second there. Okay, and we'll take a vote. And it will be 
Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Monica. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. All right, board members, we have 10 o'clock time curtains. We're not going to take the ones that are going to take a little more time. I think there's just one that will take a minute. Uh, Mr. Melvin, are you here for um, item 49 for the appointment to the – let's do that so you can get on with your day. I appreciate you being here. Good morning, members of the board. Chair Long, Mrs. Robinson, my name is Scott Powers from the County Executive Office. The matter before you is a recommendation to approve five individuals to the Ventura County Resource Conservation District's Board of Directors. The Board of Directors consists of nine members, three from each of the three uh, d divisions. One is Ohio Valley, two is Santa Clara Valley, and three is South Ventura County. Uh, public outreach was performed for this uh, action by the district, resulting in eight applications. Those ap applications were vetted by the RCD, as well as our three-person panel. Uh, the selections before you on page one of your board letter include Bud Sloan from Division One, Michael Mobley from Division Two, Sean Anderson from Division Three, Chris Devan from Division Three, and Carol Kurtz of Division Three. Additional information on the applicants is available in exhibit, page two of Exhibit One of your packet, and I'm, we're happy to answer any questions for you. So Melvin's here to help as well. Yes. Questions? I, I have a couple, if I may. Um, how, how many openings were there um, prior to this? Were all, all five of these open seats? Well, you had Sean Anderson's being reappointed, right? Two yeah. of Mike Mobley's being reappointed as well. And the total number of people on the RCD? Nine. Nine. That's, uh, that's by legislative mandate. And so you had at least four empty seats. Right? The way it's staggered is every two years they do, we do four or five, four or five like that. But the seats were empty, as opposed, like people weren't coming to the meetings? Or? There were eight. We had one vacancy in Division Three, which is the South Ventura County, um, that had not been filled. Um, we were, you know, making every effort to do that. The other uh, division seats were all full. We had eight members. We were one shy. Okay. And I know I, I think uh, I, I stoked the fires in my South Ventura County area. We got you, I think, a four uh, people to apply. And uh, is this – now, this is appointment in lieu of election. That's correct. And so um, how many did you have that applied for the, uh, for the five seats? We had one for Division One, uh, one for – we had actually two for Division One, one for Division Two, and then uh, four for Division Three. I'm just wondering um, technically how you handle that because – the basis, my understanding of when you appoint someone in lieu of election, it's because there aren't enough candidates, so you just have maybe a candidate per opening. So no, um, I, I think the Division 9 clearly states that RCDs have the option of either asking the supervisors to appoint their boards or holding elections. That's a choice the RCD makes, and they can change at any time. RCDs go back and forth. This board has uh, at, had asked at some point in the past I think it was in the early 70s, for the supervisors to make appointments just because of the cost of elections. Okay, but it, it is, we do this um, pretty routinely. We appoint in lieu of election. You had a comment? A couple things. Uh, 1994 is when that ordinance came into place that uh, um, superseded the elections for appointments first, and then elections are an option for number two, as a second option. Um, Number two is, uh, this is kind of the first time in a while that we've had more applicants than, than um, openings. So there is a vetting process. Now, usually in the last two, three years, you've seen one applicant available for one opening. So now you've seen where a vetting process needs to occur uh, to vet through these uh, in individuals and determine this final selection. That's what's happened in this case. I, I, just, I find this to be an anomaly because we appoint to probably close to two dozen different boards and districts, you know, in lieu of election. And in each of those instances that I'm aware of, there are never more than uh, the number of candidates for the open seats that are available. Because if there are more, you go to election. So that, that's why I find this to be kind of unusual. Um, Super. And, uh, Yes. It, it is. An, it's a different process, and uh, maybe we can have county council identify because it was a, actually the ordinance that adopted. In, uh, typically, we say election in lieu. Uh, I mean, excuse me, appointment in lieu of election for those cases where <clears throat> boards of directors of organ, uh, districts out there come to us and say, "Look, we've got five board members and we've got five applicants, 
and let's go to have you appoint. We're asking you to approve appointment in lieu of us holding an expensive election when there are only those. This is a little different animal, and maybe county council can address why that, why it is different, and I think it's based on the ordinance that was adopted. Yes, thank you. In this particular matter, the board adopted an ordinance in 1994, Ordinance 4066, and that, the Public Resources Code allowed for this ordinance to be adopted, and when the county adopted that ordinance, that gave to the RCD basically the option to have an election or not each time, each site election cycle, and under the ordinance, if RCD requests, I think no later than 125 days before the election or before the expiration of the term, to have the members appointed, then they have the right to do that, and then, and that's, they did that this year, and then this is the process where they're coming to the board and making nominations and recommendations to appoint these five individuals. The board can appoint, does not have to appoint these five, they can appoint any of the eight who were vetted and qualified. There are minimum qualifications to serve on the board, and I think eight met the minimum qualifications, and they are nominating and recommending these five, but it's unique because the board adopted that ordinance. The board did not have to, and the board could repeal that ordinance later, but as of now, that ordinance allows for this process. It is unusual, as you say, and so I think the difference is, is that then candidates that the board nominates aren't necessarily ones that come back to us, and also because you have more than, fortunately this time you had more than you could appoint, than we could appoint, so I would like to see a copy of that ordinance. I think it would be helpful to understand better the process. I have no objections to the folks that you are appointing. I think you have a great selection here, but I just was curious as to how we got here. Okay. That's, I appreciate the discussion on this, yes. Yeah, I have a few questions. I've had some issues brought up about the interview process, and some people did not show up for the interview, and did... Well, we asked members, RCDs can require different qualifications. Some RCDs have qualifications that you have to attend a certain number of meetings before you can apply, and things like that. Those qualifications are set by the RCDs themselves, but we generally in the past have just wanted people to show interest, and so the candidates that were recommended here, as opposed to the two that we didn't recommend, showed up, made a present, you know, at a board meeting, and talked about why they were interested. We have an application that they have to fill out to prove their qualifications to serve on the board, one of which is, you know, an interest in an understanding of the role of resource conservation districts and their non-regulatory efforts to work with, you know, everyone on natural resource conservation. So while all the candidates to me seem to be, you know, were qualified, and I did have a chance to talk to one on the phone that we didn't appoint, these were the candidates that the board felt represented where we were going and what would be of an asset to us. So you're saying... It was very, you know, it wasn't like, you know, one or the other. It was just one of the issues that came up was whether we were going to need some of the particular skills or knowledge of the ones that we didn't appoint, and with the changes, some of the changes that are coming down in the activities that we do, we felt that these people represented more about where the RCD was going. So you say some of the candidates showed up and other candidates did not show up. Right, yeah. Only two candidates that didn't show up were Mr. Burton, Burton Elliott, and I think it was... Elise Lazar. Elise Lazar. And were those candidates invited? Yeah, oh yes. I spoke with Mr. Elliott and also our finance manager spoke with Ms. Lazar. So everybody was aware of the meeting. Oh yes, yeah. Right. And you say two didn't show up, but you had eight positions for five openings. Right, well, you know, we had some incumbents. Mr. Mobley and Mr. Anderson were incumbents. The others, Mr. Sloan and then Mr. Doug Off was also an applicant who wasn't selected. Chris Devan 
but Doug Off did uh, Doug Off did attend. He did attend. Yes, they all attended except for uh, Mr. Elliott and, and and Mrs. R. Great. Um, and uh, County Council is pointing out that we could appoint any of the eight, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, as long as they uh, they have to be qualified by division. Sure. And so. what are those? Uh, do you do you have written requirements of, of what those requirements are? We have a, the Department of Conservation has a handbook for board members, uh -huh. and then uh, you know that, that we give to all the applicants for them to review. Do you have requirements? Do you have to attend a certain number of meetings? You don't have. We don't have those requirements at this time. Okay. Right. But we do have a requirement that they understand and are committed to um, this, the particular strategic goals of right. uh, our programs of this RCD. Okay. Stated uh, on our supplemental application. I, I, I'd just like to point out that that. Uh, it, only, it was only yesterday that the issue came up about uh, interviewing and uh, people that were interviewed, people that weren't interviewed, uh, and I just found out about uh, our ability to to consider the applicants. I don't have any problems with this. I don't anticipate any change, but I'd feel more comfortable if we could postpone this to our next board meeting so that as I'm approving this, I'm, I, you know, I've made sure I've, I've done my due diligence since, since it's a little bit different. We're not just, we're not just taking five candidates that were, you know, we're, we're really saying of the eight, we think they picked the right five. And uh, so anyway, that, that'd be my request. And again, I don't have any, any, and I don't have any perceived problem here or anything else, but it's just a little bit different in terms of process. So that'd be my request if other board members are comfortable with that. I would certainly support that. I, um, the in, one of the individuals chosen I've not met for, uh, that represent for that's being requested to represent South Ventura County. I know the other two that weren't uh, selected. I guess one may have been out of town for the meeting, but one has been very involved in um, uh, open space management and uh, open space a major open space group in in Thousand Oaks area. Another one is an environmental attorney and uh, an ethics commissioner. So. And they're, they're all seem to be very qualified. And I, I haven't met the individual that, that's being appointed, so I don't really know. But I'd be uh, willing to postpone it. You want to, how long do you want to wait? Just our, our next meeting, which would be after, you know, it's, it's two two weeks from now, right? Yeah, I, uh, I just point out that, you know, the, the term expires November 28th of these uh, appointments. How and often, I, I think how, that how, it's important how, how, that how often, we, how often do you meet? How often do we meet? Yeah. Once a month. When do you meet? The third Wednesday now of each month. So the, your next meeting is the third Wednesday of December. Mm -hmm. So our meeting would be well before the third meeting in December. Yes, but the, the term of office ends November 28th. Right. Yeah. But county council, we don't have to appoint before the term of office ends. Yeah, that's correct. Right. Thank you. I would re I would like encourage the board that you know I, I see this is a process that seems to be drawn out uh, with a lot of it seems like there's a lot of in, of desire to influence the outcome of this unduly and I think that's the perception in the community and I would want to make sure that we don't do that well, that's a very nice comment to make I don't think anybody was to unduly do that I, I have no you know for me the, the, I, I would have to have some reason to, to overturn this but I don't have any why well, I, I don't understand why the, the board recommendations of the board who went through the, the process defined by the division nine of the resources code and the county council's recommendations would have to be postponed. What what would be the what would be the purpose of doing that? Particularly when the two candidates that we did not uh, approve did not show up to to meetings or or you know investigate further any interest in the RCD. Um, the three candidates that came from Supervisor Park's office, not including Sean Anderson. Um, live in a very small portion of that South Ventura County area. I mean, we have the Oxnard Plain, we have so much more park area, you know, the Cayetus Watershed area. It just seems to me like those are the candidates that are going to represent the interests of the RCD and our... our uh, are, are, are you suggesting that we should uh, not do our due diligence, which is our responsibility is to say, yes, these are the right five candidates of the eight. Are you suggesting that we should just ignore that and just say what, whoever... No, no, I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just suggesting that the way that the ordinance is set up, we've asked you to appoint. We could have a meeting next week and resend that resolution and we would go back to elections. We have the power to do that as an RCD. So, uh, you know... Uh, I, uh, 
you've got rights and roles and responsibilities, and so do we. And we're just simply exercising. That's fine. Okay. You know, I don't think we can decide. Well, Supervisor Ben, I just want. I'm yeah. sorry, I wanted to add that, in, in my view, uh, the resolution can't be rescinded at this point. You know, the request was put in under the ordinance for the board to appoint so we'd have to the have directors, and the board has that power. So, so Mr. Melvin's statement that they could next week go and call uh, an election if they wanted to, you think is inaccurate? I, I think that's inaccurate. Thank you. Well, the state attorney um, has said that we, we can change the ordinance and go back to elections. That's perfectly within our purview as a special district. For future elections. For future elections. Not this one, but for future okay. elections. Yeah. Well, and that might be worthy of future discussion because sure. it certainly is a um, sure. complicated, not complicated, but convoluted process here. So, all right. Is there a motion by board members? Yes. I'd like to make a motion to continue this to our next board meeting. Any further questions on this? Uh, Madam Chair, may I just clarify the next regularly scheduled board meeting, uh, yeah. December 7th? That's right. December yeah, 7th. Thank you. All right, let's vote on that. Okay, that, uh, that passes 4 1. It will be continued and to be heard on December 7th. Um, I think that. Uh, Anytime you have two board members who have questions raised about process, it's um, a valuable step to take. And what uh, would you like us to do, if anything? Uh, well, how should I inform my board? I inform them of this vote that uh, we're going to um, bring this back to the board on December 7th, and it, and it really is just to understand fully the process. Uh, and um, I expect it will be back before the board in the same manner it is today. So, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So much for a quick one, board members. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to take a, a, a four-minute break, three-minute break, and then we're going to get to those 10 o'clock, and I apologize for that, but I think the clerk and others need a break.
Okay, board members. Board members, if we could come back to the uh, dais, please. We'll move ahead with our items. And our, the first one up is um, item 29. And uh, Supervisor Zaragoza. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, it's going to be an honor for me to uh, present the Soroptimus International of Box Art celebrating 65 years. So I'd like to call uh, Kay Hoyt and also Floyd Lamano to the, to the podium. They've been chairs and past chairs and members of uh, Soroptimus for many, many years. So I'd like to share this uh, resolution. For the Soroptimus International of Box Art was chartered by Soroptimus International in Santa Barbara on November 3rd. 1945 at a candlelight ceremony at the Colonial House in Oxnard to foster the ideal of service. Where Soroptimus International of Oxnard, one of 28 clubs in Camino Real region, part of Soroptimus International of America's Federation, is a worldwide classified organization in 120 countries with nearly, nearly excuse me, 100,000 members. Members promoting the advancement and status of women, friendship, international understanding, goodwill, and peace. Whereas Soroptimus International of Oxnard successfully raises money annually to support local region federations, international Soroptimus projects, and programs benefiting women and girls. Whereas in the past 65 years, members have supported and participated in various community-related services such as the McAvoy House, Battered Women's Shelter, Better Women's Shelter the Oxnard Strawberry Festival, Cal Works Career Closet, Giving Tree, Oxnard College Mentor Mentee Programs, Casa Soroptimus, AC Relay for Life, Oxnard Salsa Festival, Downtown Holiday Parade, and the Prototype Women's Center. Where Soroptimus International of Oxnard strives to continue to advance the status of women through the Women's Opportunity Awards, the Violet Richardson Award, Making a Difference for Women Recognition Awards, the Color Me Pink, Color Me Purple campaign, the global projects such as Projects Independence, Soroptimus Rollback Malaria, and Prevention of Domestic Violence Initiatives are supported by Soroptimus International of Oxnard through awareness, advocacy, and action. Where Soroptimus International of Oxnard celebrates 65 years of dedicated service to the best for women, in quotes, organization reaching all citizens of the community particularly women and girls. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that the Ventura County Board of Supervisors takes great pleasure in honoring Sir Optimus International of Oxnard. It's a valuable organization to the city of Oxnard and the county of Ventura. And this is presented to you on the 23rd day of September. And Kay and, and Flo, you would like to share a couple of words, and I'll go down and share this resolution with you. Thank you very much, John. Mm -hmm. I want to thank the Board of Supervisors for this honor. Bestowed to uh, the Soroptimus International of Oxnard. As John mentioned, we are part of 90,000 women throughout the world, representing 125 countries, and of course that's expanding every day. Uh, we, we have uh, where well, we are dedicated to the prevention primarily of human trafficking in women. We are also working on a program here in, in uh, Ventura County to see that all of the high schools have bookmarks that will address the issues of abuse so that all teenagers are aware of this type of behavior and, and uh, able to uh, take care of uh, any abuse that occurs within their in their lives. Um, our program of distribution of these book bookmarks throughout the high school will help teenagers learn the traits of abusive behavior. We want to thank you again for acknowledging us. Many of you I see have supported us throughout the years and thank you so much. I do want to add that although Soroptimus International is a women's organization, we do have men as members. <laughs> so just wanted you to know that we do have men as part of our membership. Thank you for the honor. And you do great work for us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Kay and Flo, Flo, for coming in, and Supervisor for making the presentation. Good work. All right, next up, um, board members, we have our monthly report on investments for the month ending October 31st, and it's always a pleasure to have Mr. Hansen step forward to do that, and also to welcome to the boardroom our Treasurer Tax Collector elect, Stephen Hintz. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. That's one less job for me, introducing him. Good. Uh, and very happy that he could attend today. Well, looking at the 122 rate for the month of uh, October, enjoy it. Because it's not going to be too much longer before we break the buck and go below 1%. <coughs> I've probably spent a couple hundred million this week uh, in the one-year area at 0 0.30. So... You know what that does, more water in the soup. But um, looking at the projection for interest rates in the future, looking at the Fed meetings, um, even September and November of 11, there's only a 25 to 35 percent chance that they will raise rates a half a point. So our outlook isn't very good. Uh, for those of, even though they are not a benchmark, uh, because their portfolio is composed of a, a lot of investments that we wouldn't buy, uh, LAFE is in at about 0.46 right now. But uh, looking at the future, like I said, we'll break the buck, and I hope to level out around 0 0.75, 0 0.8 for the middle of the uh, year for next year. An update on property tax collection. Uh, my associate uh, Don Hansen has done a fantastic job and uh, has been running the department and we look forward, both of us, to working with Steve Hintz. Um, taxes, we've already had about 28 percent of the bills paid this year. Um, that compares with 18% for last year. So everything is going normal in the collection cycle. And the only bad part is I don't know where I'm going to put $400 million or what the rate will be. But um, I was at a TOC meeting last week. Uh, Supervisor Bennett is the chairman. And uh, we were talking about the phone calls I get about doing a little extra for a little extra yield and all the new ideas that the brokers come up with. And it was interesting, uh, Ken Prosser, who's the assistant superintendent of schools and is my best customer, he has about $900 million with us, so definitely a good customer, kind of stopped the meeting and said, don't worry about rate. Remember credit, marketability, and then rate. So stay the course. Schools isn't interested in shooting the lights out. We just want to have the money. So I also want to thank Supervisor Bennett for running that meeting. We have it semi-annually, and it was uh, an excellent meeting. Other than that, I want to say Happy Thanksgiving to all of you and to Ian and his associates up there who always do such a good job. Uh, it'll be a 5- or 10-pound gain for me Thanksgiving because Marie's such a good cook. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, and questions, yes. If I, if, if I could, I, I know we're, we're all going to get frustrated with the yield uh, that we're going to get on this. Um, and I know that the predictions are that the Fed doesn't have any intention to raise the rates. Uh, but I do think it's, it merits pointing out that um, countries that run large budget deficits and also large trade deficits, um, when the credit market turns on those countries, it can turn rapidly and, and uh, with a vengeance, and rates could potentially drive up quickly, uh, you know, when, you know, in, un, in an un, unanticipated way. So we wouldn't have the predictions or anything else. And I think that we have to recognize that's a, at least a possibility for the United States, not in the next few months, but certainly 
in the not too distant mm -hmm. future that we could have a spike just because creditors around the world finally decide that we're not pulling it together in terms of solving our, our budget deficit problem. That, that's an excellent observation and we've all seen with the 9-11s and all this other stuff that goes on uh, when you least expect it you're absolutely right. And of course, we all know Toyota was a good example. Which is and, and if you look at if you look at Greece's interest rates, you know, all of a sudden Greece got on the radar screen, and bang, their interest rates went, uh, I think, from four to ten percent or so. You know, mm -hmm. just huge increases. And Spain is a big problem. It's not uh, if, but when. Right. So Spain and, and, is definitely going to have and, some and very tough times. And Portugal times. also. Right. Yes. So, right. So anyway, yeah. it's. So, yeah, so I, I, I want to thank you, and I think the uh, the key thing that uh, we're looking here in your investment is safety, the safety, and also maintaining our principal, even though we're getting minimal uh, interest on that. But uh, I think the, uh, your investments in, in the safety of our uh, of our dollars is extremely important. So, and as long as we maintain that principal with with a little bit of interest, we're doing good. And the credit, of course. You know, some things never change. It was Will Rogers that said, it's not the rate of return on my principal, but the return of my principal <laughs> I'm interested right. in. So <laughs> some things really never change. And I want to thank you for that. Yeah, well, I have a question. Um, I know that there's a, a lot of investing in the federal home loan and banks and that provide credit. And uh, at a time when so many of those banks are having difficulty because people are having difficulty paying for their mortgages. Is that um, the best uh, we can do? It's the safest thing we can do right now. I, I read the articles on Fannie Mae and the Home Loan and all that, and I get back to what I said a long time ago. These were agencies enacted by Congress. It's an unwritten or implied guarantee. Just like when the post office had problems, uh, you know, they stepped in. We've certainly bailed out a lot of companies, which really aggravates me by giving them money. But right now, short of treasury bills, which are really low, in some cases negative yield, we're in the best thing we can uh, get into. And on a related point, by what uh, Supervisor Bennett said, if the government presents any doubt in the investor's mind about these agencies and doesn't support them, there will go our interest rates because then it'll get to uh, where they're nervous about the credit quality and that'll drive up rates quicker than anything. So I think that Fannie Mae Home Loan, Freddie Mac, it's more the accounting end and I don't think it's a matter of credit quality. And they both are, they're all rated AAA by S&P and Moody's. So, I mean, short of digging a hole in the backyard out there in the management lot and putting the money, <laughs> I, I think it's the <laughs> safest thing we can do. And, and still, I'm only getting 0.3 for a year, but uh, you will see articles in the newspaper, but I, I don't think it's the credit end, it's the way those companies are run. Any other questions, comments? To so receive and file action on the report. Mm -hmm. As always, we appreciate the. Thank you. See you next month regarding the investment policy, page one. Mr. Safety, marketability, <laughs> rate of return. So Keep I'll up the good work. You. Keep up the good work, Mr. Hanson. We're fortunate to have you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It's always <coughs> educational too. And that uh, receive and file action is unanimous. All right, next on our agenda, we have item 31, which is a public hearing regarding our local our Land Conservation Act. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Andrea Osdi with the Planning Division. And this morning's request to you is for the approval of the, this year's LCA contracts and a zone change. We've been implementing the LCA program since 1969. It's been a program with the state since 1965. So it's a, it's a historical program with, with our county over the last 40 years. And it's been an effective land use tool in preserving agriculture and open space areas. The way the LCA contracts work is that we, the county, receive the assurance that property owners will, will keep their land in open space and agriculture and property owners will receive a tax break. Eligibility for, for ag contracts is that property owners need to ensure that a certain percentage of land is in agriculture and that depends on the size of the, 
the properties. Contracts are self-renewing, meaning that 10 or 20 year contracts are always in their first year of the contract unless contract owners or the county decides to non-renew a contract. So the, the point of the program is that it's a, a long-term program and that property owners need to be committed to keeping their land in agriculture. Exhibit 8 in your packet is land currently under non-renewal. And we've had one notice of non-renewal filed this year for a 127-acre lot in Santa Paula, and that was our first notice of non-renewal recorded in the last three years. Because the county collects reduced rate property taxes as a result of LCA contracts, the state has typically reimbursed us for a portion of that foregone property tax. And the subvention payments that we receive have been about 300000 annually over the last several years. However, in the last couple of years, we've had the, the state budget crisis and the state has reduced that amount. And now in the last year, we have not received any money at all. So that is why we came back to you in January and requested your, your input. And you decided that we would go forward. We would take in contracts for the upcoming year for 2010. And that is the, the group of contracts that we have with, with you here today. On December 14th, the RMA uh, Director Chris Stevens will be back before you to discuss new legislation that's known as SB 863, and that is a, a brand new piece of legislation that allows counties the opportunity to reduce the terms of contracts in exchange for uh, reducing the, the amount of property tax break to owners. So it's a, it's a temporary fix, it's a Band-Aid, and we don't yet know how that will play out, but Chris Stevens will be before you next month so we can discuss that in, in more detail. And we will also at that time be requesting your approval to take in contracts for the 2011 calendar year. This year we have two proposed contracts. One is a new contract up in Ojai. It's 44 acres and it also goes with a zone change from OS 40 acres to AE 40 acres. And that contract cannot be recorded until the zone change is approved, which is part of the request today. The other contract is in Fillmore. It is a rescission reentry and it is to adjust the contract boundaries as a result of a lot line adjustment. It's a very minor change. So we have about 44 acres coming into contract this year, and we have about 129,000 acres of LCA contracted land throughout the county. The Ag Policy Advisory Committee and the Planning, uh, Planning Commission have all voted to approve this year's contracts and the zone change. So you have a unanimous uh, approval, and hopefully you will make that choice as well. And uh, the findings, the 2010 proposed contracts comply with the State Williamson Act, the County LCA guidelines, the general plan, and the non-coastal zoning ordinance. Public notice was made in the Ventura County Star to LAFCO and mailed to neighbors within 300 feet of, of those properties, and also to the planning director of the city of Fillmore because of the proximity to that city of one of the, the proposed contracts. So the planning division recommends that your board take the actions listed on pages one and two of the board letter to approve the proposed contracts and the proposed zone change. And that concludes my presentation. Any okay. questions? Other questions? Supervisor Clarks. Um, can you uh, tell me why the zone change is being requested? Because we also provide for open space zoned land too, don't we? contracts. Right, and we do, but the reason is that that 44 acre property is in agriculture and they would like to have the agricultural contract, not the open space contract. They is don't there more, Is there more uh, money available or more of a tax break if from one than the other? The ag contracts are definitely um, a better tax break. Okay, that's probably why. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions? This is a public hearing. Um, I will at this time open uh, for any public comments, and we have not any requests to speak on this item. All right, we'll close the public hearing then. No further questions. It's before the board. Action. Make a motion. Second. There's a motion and a second to approve no. the recommended the action. There's a motion and a second to approve the recommended action. <laughs> Please vote. There you go. <laughs>
Okay. That uh, is adopted. And thank you for your staff work on that. Excellent report. Thank you. And as was mentioned, um, board members, this item, at Wood, there was quite a bit of discussion at CSAC because there are counties that have tremendous risk and investment in LCA. So we will hear about that when Chris brings that forward. Anything there, Roberta, I need to know? Okay. All right, then item 32 is next. Um, this is a second public hearing regarding uh, changes to uh, building and safe recycling and diversion. I yes. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Chair Long, members of the board, and Ms. Robinson. Uh, for the record, I am Bruce Beluski, the manager of the Integrated Waste Management Division of the Public Works uh, Water and Sanitation Department. The item now before you is the second public hearing of a recommended amendment to County Ordinance 4357, which is the county's construction and demolition debris re uh, diversion requirement uh, originally adopted by your board in January of 2007. Owing to a recent change to the Green Building Standards Code by the California Building Standards Commission, this recommended amendment to the county's ordinance ensures consistency with the new state code. We are also using this occasion to update two governmental organization names which have since changed uh, within the ordinance since it was adopted almost four years ago. Um, as required by law, a summary of the proposed ordinance changes was published in the local newspaper within the appropriate time frame. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, I want to wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving and I'd be pleased to answer any questions you might have. Thank okay. you. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, there is no uh, public request cards on this. I don't have any. So okay. concludes any public hearing we might have. There's a motion and a second to move ahead on the adopted item. Recommend and, and we items. wish you a, a happy Thanksgiving, too. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. For the report. Okay, now item 33. Second hearing regarding adoption of proposed ordinance to the building BCBC. Mr. McDonald. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Long. Ms. Robinson, members of the board, let me put my glasses on so I can see here. This keeps getting worse every year. Um, the recommended action, uh, my name is Jim McDonald. I'm the county building official. The recommended action for you today is to uh, uh, adopt the uh, proposed revisions to the Ventura County Building Code uh, that were presented at the first public hearing on October 12th. Uh, during this public hearing period, we've received no comment, emails, phone calls, or any feedback from any member of the public. I guess the building code is just not as exciting as I think it is. Um, with that, uh, I am available to answer any questions. Questions, board members? <laughs> and we also, just for the record, don't have any public comment cards submitted, correct? Okay. Okay, second hearing. So motion and second to approve that. No. Is Mr. Melvin present? He had a card submitted on this item? Okay, don't see him. Okay. We will move ahead. There's a motion and a second to adopt the recommended action on the second hearing. And please vote. Happy Thanksgiving to you all. Thank you, too. That passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, item 34, 1030, time certain item. And it is from our, as our Ventura County Fire Protection District, Chief Roper. Second hearing regarding adoption of the Fire Protection District Ordinance 27 um, is before the board for discussion. Uh, again, a second hearing and it's some uh, additions and amendments and actions on Ordinance um, 27 and 26. Chief Roper, good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Ms. Robinson. Happy Thanksgiving, too. Um, on November 9th, we had the first reading of the Ordinance Number 27, which puts it into place and repeals Ordinance 26. During the, my presentation, I made you aware of a letter that we received from the Farm Bureau 
and we also ask for, for permission by your board to modify Chapter 19 of the ordinance to have, uh, following the discussions with the Farm Bureau. Since that time, we have met with the Farm Bureau, and you have a copy of a letter from the Farm Bureau that states uh, their position now on it, that they understand it and so forth. You also had a, uh, added to your agenda this morning a, a copy of a letter from the Santa Susana and Knowles Homeowners Association. And what they were doing is reacting to a newspaper article because they heard about the ordinance, but they didn't know what it was, and so they stated their concerns. We have since followed up with them and met with them also, and you have a copy of the letter from them stating their position now. Um, currently, what you have is a uh, document, a memo from us uh, with some minor grammatical changes and some changes to the ordinance as I presented to you on November 9th. And I'm, pre I'm prepared to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, questions. I have a number of them. Uh, okay. I hope okay. you don't mind. And, uh, and, and I, I, I support the idea of the fire department working with the Farm Bureau and trying to work things out and stuff. But at the same time, I, I just want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence from our side of it. Um, and so I've got some questions that, that I hope will make me feel comfortable as we go forward. Um, first, is, is there a regulatory standard for agricultural compost piles that's different than landscaping compost piles? that you're aware of? Um, let me kind of try to answer that question in a different way. Uh, in our discussions with the Farm Bureau, one of the things that we wanted to make clear is there's a difference between what we consider as mulch or landscaping material or for agricultural purposes versus composting materials. Mm -hmm. And where our concern is this is, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, we used uh, the Pixweek mushroom fire that we had. That was actually a composting operation where they brought in material from the racetracks, composted it, and used it for seed bed for the mushroom uh, purposes for growing. In that process, as it decomposes, it generates heat. Okay? Mulching is different. Mulching is really bringing in the green waste, the green materials that's processed, and then it does generate some heat, but not to the extent. And so what we're looking at is mulching working with the ag community. Their concern was primarily the mulching operation and the landscape, the use of the la that for landscaping. So our concern, our focus is really on those piles that either, are either brought in and not maintained that generates heat that causes fires or the composting operation that has to be regulated because it does generate the heat. And our provisions were just providing the guidelines on the safe storage and operating procedures for that as they generate the heat. So are we making a distinction? So if somebody's bringing in composting material that generates heat, are they going to have a different standard? Um, well, it's on the guidelines in our, on our standard that we have. Yes, you can bring in X amount of material, and as long as you're processing it for mulching and you're moving it, in and out so it's not generating the heat, then that's different than if you're, it's going to be used just for composting or it's not being used, we're going to treat it as composting, and then we have other standards for that. And those standards include a permit? Yes. All right. So if it generates, if it's going to sit and generate the heat, then you have to get the permit. Yeah, what we're basically saying is if you're using it for a mulching operation, then you don't need a permit. You'll be able to move it in and move it out, okay? <sighs> If you're going to move it over to a composting, then you'll be required to have a permit so that we can work with it. Okay. Um, let me ask. Um, uh, all right. So, so I, I understand that. The compost pile that started the Gulberson fire, was that an agricultural compost pile? Was that a mulching pile? What was that pile? Uh, I would consider it... Um, uh, I would consider it on the verge of an illegal dump almost because it was brought in with, with we couldn't find any real intention to manage it or anything it, because as it was brought in it was generating revenue as it was being dumped mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the property owner is non-existent anymore and he has lost the property so we can't really prove really did he have a viable operation or not but what he had was an absorbent amount of material okay, that was brought in that was not managed or maintained and that generated heat. 
Now, he has a neighbor uh, who has a model operation who brings in mulch, processes it, and then distributes it and sells it, okay, which is a model operation right next to each other. So the gentleman that you're talking about, that operation was one of those that was brought in as mulch. It was not dealt with. We didn't even know about it at the time. So if we did know about it, let's say somebody called you up and said, hey, this guy's doing this. Uh, what kind of enforcement action would we, we have been able to take from a fire safety perspective, and how would these guidelines modify that that potential action? Okay, we would if we were called with somebody's bringing in truckloads of material, we would go out and work with a property owner to find out what is their intention to do with it. Mm -hmm. We would document that, and we would take it if they're bringing in for mulch and they're going to dispose of it within X number of days, then. Fine, we'll monitor that if it's dealt that way. We would give them the information on how to monitor the piles for the heat content and build up and how to rectify it. If we find out that they're not disposing of it, then we would go into a permit application process with the requirements, the setbacks, the fire safety procedures that would go with it, and we would monitor that for completion. So we would monitor, and, and if they didn't follow that, then we'd say they were out of compliance. Right. And we, then there'd be, all right. So would the standards that we have set up here allow us to do that for somebody that's not moving the pile? Correct. All right. Okay. Um, my next question is um, the, 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 um, this standard would have prevented that compost fire from starting at Gulberson then, if we adopt the standard, we have the same thing happen. If we know about it, if we find out about it, there would we would be able to take some action. Yeah. And and I guess my my question is, all the times that we don't know, but if we don't require any permit, and I'm not saying we necessarily should require a permit, but we don't require any kind of notification or anything, what's the possibility of these piles building up and becoming a fire hazard? We're not aware of it and then we've got a problem. Uh, can you help me with that? Well, in our dialogue with the Farm Bureau, one of the things that we're asking for is under the mulch operation is we would be asking for the property owner, if they bring it in, is to register that with us. They don't need a permit, but at least acknowledge with us that the material is being brought in. Great. That way we can at least monitor where it's coming from, how much they're storing, so that we're aware of it. And so that is a requirement that they have to register. Correct. Okay. All right. So that, 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 that addresses a lot of that. All right. And then my final question is, are, are there standards for brush clearance around these piles? And how do they compare with clearance around buildings? Uh, for compost piles, you know, in other words, the ones that do generate heat, and then for mulch piles. Are there standards for brush clearance around compost piles? Not necessarily around, okay, not around the compost piles. What we're trying to do is get the compost segregated from the standing brush X number of difference. It does the same thing. And then what we also are proposing is that we would have the application rate would be limited within so many feet from a structure so we don't encumber a structure too. So both of them were taking care of the fire safe practices either from the structure or from the native fuel. But if you have a, if you, if you have a compost pile mm -hmm. that is a fire risk that generates heat, <clears throat> There's not a 100-foot yeah. clearance? Or well, there will be basically if it's a compost pile, we're looking at close to a 500-foot setback from the native fuels. Okay. So we have plenty Excellent. of room. Excellent. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Chief, you know, the, the question I have is that mulch, when it comes in, what's the timeline to remove it from when they bring it in? What, what, is there a certain time that, uh, that they have to remove that mulch that comes in? The uh, working with the Farm Bureau, we're, we're coming up with that date right now, okay, because a lot of it depends on the, quali the, uh, the components of the mulch that's brought in, what's included, what is the moisture content, what's the ambient air temperature and so forth outside, which all are components of when does it cause the heat com composition to start bringing to, up. To generate that. So we're creating a window right now, and we're still working on that. So, so many days, and then they yes. can move it out. To, you know, and I think hopefully what this, um, your uh, updates here in the Fire Code Protection District is going to help uh, eliminate what happened in the Pix uh, Sweet uh, Fire. I remember that really impacted South Bank and North Oxnard for many, many days, you know. Correct. 
Yeah. And Pick, PickSuite has completely changed their process now, so they're not storing the large quantities at all like they were at that time. Because I remember those files were probably as high as the ceiling, you know, out there at the peak suite. So that's going to help us tremendously Correct. eliminate that kind of uh, problem. Correct. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Um, Chief, we, uh, we do have some public comment cards on this item, so if you'd like to. Okay. Linda Ford McAfee. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Ms. Robinson. I'm Linda Ford McCaffrey. I live on Brook Road in the Ventu Park area. I wanted to make my support known for this modifications of these ordinances, particularly the things that are going to maintain fire access at all times in these roads, and particularly on red flag days, the fire critical days. I didn't see any exemption in what I read for one thing that I wanted to express concern about. And that is when you have vehicles that are temporarily parked on a street, whether they're for doing deliveries or they're doing pickups or in the process of a move, picking up or delivering household goods in a move, I think that those should not be subject to tow if they are attended by somebody who can operate them and who will move them when told to. If they refuse to move them, yes, I think they should be cited and towed. But I think particularly in an area like Bentu where they're it's really tough to deliver a refrigerator without blocking the street. It's just not easily done at all. Um, I also wanted to point out that I think you'll probably hear a lot of uh, comments and complaints from people saying that, well, I just don't have any place to park except along the streets in the Ventu Park area, maybe over at the Knolls too. And I can't speak for all of Ventu Park, but I can make some comments about Brook Road and put these forward for your consideration. There are 29 homes on Brook Road. 21 of those homes have garages. Only five of those garages are used to park vehicles. Four of the homes have carports, only two of which are used for park vehicles. There's only four homes on the whole street that have neither carports nor garages. And two of those still manage to park all their vehicles off the street. There are approximately 14 homes on the street that routinely or always are parking cars on the street. As you know, we have the nominally 20-foot road, so if you are parking on the street, you're by definition, you are partially blocking that 20-foot road because that's all that exists. So with that, I do want to uh, make one other thing, a comment on one other thing. We're lucky on Brook. We have this big, huge, empty lot. There's usually somewhere between 8 and 12 vehicles parked on that lot. But if that lot is sold or uh, fenced off, it would add all of those vehicles, probably all parking on the road. So, you know, it's a big consideration, but there's an awful lot of unused garages and unused carports that could be used for parking. And I urge you, please pass the ordinance and immediately uh, enforce the ordinance, particularly on those red, red flag days. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you for your comments and for coming in this morning. Supervisor? Yeah, I also want to thank you, and I know that the Ventu Park Fire Safe Council has weighed in very positively on this, and we had a Tina Raz now here last time speaking in favor of this also. But, you, well, you have a good question we can ask the fire chief regarding the temporary loading issue. Uh, we'll finish the public comments, and that way if there are other questions. Um, thank you, though. Uh, Nelson Summers? Good morning. Good morning. I'm Nelson Summers, uh, Santa Clara Organics and also Summers Ranches. Um, I'm a third generation farmer out here in Ventura County. We all also operate uh, Ojai Valley Organics, which is uh, a company up in Ojai that we operate on the old uh, Ventura County transfer station and, uh, and we rent it, rent the property from the county of Ventura. And I'm a little bit nervous about some of the rules as far as the fire safety standards coming into, uh, you know, the distances from brush and other things. Because, for instance, if you have ditches now running through any of your properties um, with the new fish and game regulations and the steelhead and everything else, they won't allow you to clean out 
ditches on your property so you have to let the brush start to grow in these ditches and um, the next thing you know if you have a 500 foot clearing that could be a thousand feet 500 foot on each side of a of a ditch a thousand feet of area where you're really restricted on the use of mulch is a is a major problem for a rancher so we also are uh, out on Guyberson Road. We're the neighbors of where the Guyberson Road fire started at. And uh, basically, this this guy that was out there was not a farming operation. He was a complete lunatic that was just running around up there. I think he was homeless, actually, just kind of hiding up on this ranch. And basically, he uh, was just bringing in this mulch, and he was dumping it right into the brush and into the creek bed and just a complete out of control maniac and and the agencies were pretty well uh, informed what was going on up there but maybe there was no way they could uh, do any enforcing on it because there's no rules so if, if we can come up with some sort of rules and regulations to control a guy that's doing something like that for sure it needs to be uh, needs to be done but it also needs to really be watched close for an operation like we have, where we have water trucks and dozers and excavators and a lot of equipment and 30 employees that, you know, depend on, on our farming operation and also our mulching operation and, and uh, you know, trying to recycle and, and to help the environment. We have 300 acres of organic oranges that we grow and also some other lemons, basically citrus. And, we grow uh, about 300 acres of avocados, and uh, we use mulch. The mulch is really, really uh, beneficial for the fighting of phytophthora root rot that could uh, affect the avocado trees. It's something that has to be used for organic farming. It's a real uh, nutritious for the roots of the trees and weed suppression and, and all of that. And if it's properly maintained and, and monitored, it can, can be a real... Uh, positive for the environment keeping all that material from going to the landfills and and uh, just uh, it's a really good thing the mulching operation but we are concerned about all the the fire stuff and I, I just hope that we make sure that that there's um, you know, different things that we can do that can be checked the fire department can come out and check and see if you have the proper fire fighting equipment proper uh, you know, monitoring from uh, temperature thermometer probes and stuff for monitoring the temperatures, which we do on the mulch, um, and just to make sure it's a, you know, up and up operation. So I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, that we can can work with the fire department and, and work with the county and keep on doing what we're doing and keep this, this mulch a viable part of uh, agriculture. So... I just want to thank you and have a good Thanksgiving, and we'll talk to you later. Thank you, Mr. Summers. And I'm certainly aware of the good work you do at Santa Clara Organics, and I expect that uh, the chief can follow through on your request to have someone come out and walk the property with you and talk about what this, um, what the rules will call for. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ole DeGorsch. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Dr. Oleg Dolgovich from the University of California. Um, I work here with Cooperative Extension, which is a department just across the street from here. Oh, yes. uh, I'd like to make some comments about uh, mulch. My colleagues, uh, Dr. Faber and Dr. Dowder and me, uh, worked extensively with mulch. We did a lot of scientific work and published it in journals, so we developed a lot of expertise in this area. And two points I'd like to bring uh, for your attention. First, I'd like to reiterate the value of mulch. This is one of the success stories in the county is how we can take a, a waste and recycle, upcycle it to the resource, which is invaluable to farmers. We have a lot of published data on the value of mulch as a phytophthora root rot protection for many tree species, as well as a weed control uh, measure, which will reduce use of herb herbicides in the county, as well as uh, erosion and water conservation uh, potential of mulch is really uh, essential. We have no runoff. Um, so there's a lot of information we develop which is available upon request from our office. So we should be very careful in regulating those uh, 
uh, types of applications in commercial setting in the orchards because the value of it is so important to us, uh, I believe. And secondly, about fire hazard, uh, we're certainly all very much concerned about this. Uh, but if you look at the properly applied mulch in the orchard systems, which is a commonly used here, you will see that uh, it is spread relatively thin, and we have irrigation systems in place to irrigate the trees or shrubs in this mulch. So suddenly you have a, a well-managed irrigated system um, with microsprinklers, and what happens with the action of water and microorganisms, this mulch deteriorates gradually, it uses a carbon source, and becomes soil. It contributes to our soil organic matter, which is also a valuable thing for us, and certainly not a, as much of a fire hazard as you would uh, imagine in the absence of mulch having a dry vegetation of weeds, uh, native and non-native species, which actually adjusted uh, because of their ecology to a fire cycle, and even if you use glyphosate, such as Roundup, it leaves a residue behind, which is a dry biomass, perhaps more prone to, uh, to fire hazard as, as mulch in the current setting that's being used right now. My, my bottom line is, before decisions are made, it would be nice to uh, have best available science uh, and information available before harsh decisions are made to reduce uh, uh, applicability of mulch to this very important operations in the county. So uh, we'll be able to answer questions uh, of any help to this uh, process as much as possible. So thank you. And thank you for your comments. Any questions? Let me, yeah. Sir, let me ask you. Yeah. Are you concerned that we're reducing the use of mulch too much in this? The concern was about the uh, uh, piling depth, and the concern was uh, whether the mulch can be a fire hazard. And wh what I'm saying is it has to be evaluated properly before a decision is made. That's, that's the bottom line. We haven't done particular studies. We have fire ecologists with UC that are very capable of providing this kind of information. And so before the decisions are made, I want to make sure that those resources are being consulted and uh, decisions are ma uh, made on, based on this. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, no further public comment request? I have no further. Okay, back to uh, the board and to Chief Roper to address some of the comments, perhaps. And um, okay, first of all, about the temporary uh, parking of vehicles. Uh, in any of the areas that we're going to be lucky enough to get the private property owners to adopt uh, the provisions within the ordinance, uh, we can certainly work with them. and. Because we don't have a ready police force to come out and enforce the no parking, there's going to be plenty of time for people to temporarily drop off refrigerators or something, delivery, that type of thing. So I don't see that as any issue as we work with that program. As far as the um, Mr. Summers' comments about the fire, um, in the, from the Guyberson fire, we were lacking some of the provisions that we needed to ensure fire safety in the future, and that's why we've worked with the other county agencies to bring this ordinance as a revision from that. We had the issues with Picks Week. We had the issues with the Guyverson fire, and we're trying to prevent that. So I feel confident that the new provisions will do that. As far as um, from our speaker from the UC system, is we in no way want to uh, inhibit the use of mulch in the operations. All we're trying to do is just make sure that the mulch as it's brought in, used, and distributed is just done in a fire safe practice so we don't have, it doesn't add to a conflagration. Yes. Real quick. Um, going back to the delivery thing. So we, there, you know, the person drives up and has a truck and refrigerator dropped off, I think the person said. That's not an issue, so we're not going to be, but if somebody says moving and they have a moving van there or something that could be there for hours. Is there some exception we can we do? I mean, you don't want to, you know, hopefully a moving van can be moved. Somebody's there working with that car right now. If the fire is coming, something you could do, right? That yeah. That can be moved quick enough. I guess I'm just trying to make sure we don't disrupt too much of these people's lives. Well, or, as we go into a community, we are going to remember by the rules of the <laughs> parking ordinance, we have to gain the private property owner's permission for them to post it as no parking. Right. Okay. And so we could very well have six houses as no parking, one house has parking, the next six houses as no parking, right. okay? Because this is a cooperative program. So as we go in and work with fire safe councils or neighborhoods, we will be trying to sell the benefits. We may even talk to them that if they're gonna take deliveries, is take deliveries in the morning, not in the afternoon of a high fire hazard day when yeah. normally fires start. So most of this is going to be done through community education and relationship building. Great, great. 
And then the maybe I missed it when you were talking about when he brought up the, the farmer about the ditch being too close to 500 because I know fishing game doesn't let you touch any of those anymore. What was your response on that? How did you? What we're going to end up doing is working with each uh, landowner to look at their operation, look at the lay of the land, the slope. We're going to be looking at where the wind patterns come, east and west are the normal wind patterns, and we'll be looking at all exposures. So we, by, when we come up with rules, we have to have a number. But also, these numbers are contained in the standard of the fire district, which gives me the purview to adjust the numbers to the business operation okay. as That's needed. So again, it can be flexible to yes. help work through some of the issues. Yes. OK, great. Madam Chair, and I think uh, Mr. Summers uh, sounds like he runs a good operation and he's got the temperature gauge, he's following all the rules, he's got water, he's got the bulldozers, he's got everything that is needed, you know, for for that kind of operation. So I think, as was mentioned earlier, maybe working with Mr. Summers uh, and fine-tuning his operation might be a good, a good thing to do. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Supervisor Parks, did you have a comment? I, the no parking that we were referring to, isn't that primarily for uh, red flag days? Uh, yeah, it's primarily for red flag days as we work with the private property owners. It would be posted on the signs and so forth, yes. So that's what the no parking, I'll say no parking during, you know, Yes. the red flag days. Are, okay, thank you. Okay, any further questions? Again, this is a second hearing. We appreciate all the comments and continue to do the work on this. Um, action of the board, motion is second. And I just really want to thank the fire chief. And we've been working on this in Venti Park for a long time. And if this can help uh, that fire, at, you know, get the fire engines up during uh, emergencies and helping people to evacuate, you know, that that's a real problem. And I really appreciate your working towards solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, please vote. And that thank passes you, unanimously. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate okay. the work on it. Item 35 is um, another fire protection district item. Yeah, uh, 35 is just a follow-up to item number 34 mm -hmm. that is actually an adoption of the Section 610 and Appendix L for the unincorporated areas of the county. Right. Move it the Motion and a second. Please vote. And that passes unanimously also. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate Thank you. it. All right, um, 11 o'clock, time certain, is a Water District 17 item. Good morning, Mr. Pakala. Good morning, Chair Long, members of the board, uh, Mrs. Robinson. <laughs> Ray Pakala with uh, Water and Sanitation Department of the County Public Works Agency. This is a public hearing for the proposed water rate increase for Ventura County Water Work District number 17. Uh, district provides water supply to more than 700 properties in the community of Bell Canyon. Water is imported from Metropolitan Water District of Southern California through Cayuga Smith Water District and City of Simi Valley. Water is lifted more than 800 feet uh, in three different pump stations before it gets to community of Bell Canyon. The imported water rates for calendar year 2011 are going up by 10% and also the Edison power costs are going up. We reviewed the impact of the imported water rate and also the Edison power charges and prepared a detailed water rate analysis and presented it to the Citizens Advisory Committee appointed by your board. On September 17th, the District Advisory Committee unanimously concurred with a 10% water rate increase for the commodity rate for calendar year 2011. The proposed water rates are subject to Proposition 218 protest hearings. A 45-day notice of the proposed water rate increase was mailed to all of the property owners on October 8th of this year. Your clerk of your board have, has received one protest letter which has been included in your board package. Our office in Moore Park did not receive any phone calls about this proposed water rate increase. Uh, if, should your board approve the proposed water rate increase, on average, the estimated monthly increase is about $19 per month. 
that will go up from $207 to $228 per month. We are recommending that your board approve staff recommendations in our staff report. That concludes my verbal presentation. I'll be glad to take any questions you might have. Any questions? I have a question, Supervisor. This is a Supervisor Voice District, right? Mm -hmm. Val Canyon, right? Have you looked at it? You, you As a matter of fact, uh, Reddy and Jeff and I sat down for a couple hours, went through this whole deal on water rate increases and went through some. And I think we said, what, 78, 79 percent of the total cost of all this is purchase of water, electricity cost. Because part of my goal was what can we do to maintain our own things that we control, that we can we do. And it was, uh, and we've done an awful lot, I think, to go through this to find some ways to reduce the costs. Um, so it's uh, it's hard. I know that Reddy has no desire to want to come here and ask for a rate increase. So it's been really difficult to deal with this. And, and we get some of these areas, Bell Canyon are tough, but you get into more park and some of the places we're going, and some of the other ones that we're dealing with in Somas, where the water now is coming out very hard, and people are having very difficult to put soft water uh, conditioners on their water, and, and still getting rate increases. Plus, at the same time, we've asked everybody to cut back, and they've cut back, and they're still getting water increases. I mean, it's. It's a difficult situation, but um, we also realize without this, we have no additional funds to try to keep improving our pipelines and everything else, which a small portion goes to. But it's uh, until we can solve our water problem in Sacramento, uh, it's not going to happen here, these water increases. So I'm glad it's not 17 or 20 percent that we've seen in the past. So, no, I agree with this. I, I have uh, two things I'd like to address. One is the letter that was sent from Bell Canyon was uh, pointed out that uh, we don't notice, we don't give them the opportunity to respond by email. And maybe we can include that in the notices too, that, so that they have a greater ability to have um, redress, as it were. And the second thing is that uh, we had to do the same thing at a Triumpho and passing on the rate increase. And I was asking if Cayegas has. Uh, being the kind of the middleman here because it comes from MWD to us through them, if they've increased at all, taken anything for themselves in this pass through. And what was explained to me is that in 2009 there was a rate deferral surcharge. You remember where we, they deferred the rates I think until January. And then what they did is they tacked $38 per acre foot on as this rate deferral surcharge. Um, now, for 2011, they took it off, but what they did instead is they added it to the capital construction surcharge. So that exact $38 um, per acre foot charge was then added to something they're calling capital construction. So um, it was an, an opportunity for them to take something that they had tagged on uh, for a surcharge and then uh, didn't have that surcharge go away. And that gives me some concern, and um, I requested at Triumpho that we write a letter to Cayegas, um, uh, letting them know that we don't think that, you know, at this time they should be adding surcharges on to these pass-throughs. So I would like our board to do that, too, because I think it's, you know, not, not a good time to be tagging on more money than I think is uh, required. At once it, they call it a surcharge for um, deferring a rate, and now it's just been um, taken into their capital uh, set aside. So I don't know how the other board members feel about that, but um, I, I would. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cayegas Municipal Water District at this time is really reviewing their capital program. Uh, they have a big uh, investment coming up in uh, what they call a brand line or a salinity management pipeline. Uh, the capital cost for that could be as high as $150 million. And uh, that's something that uh, we, at least I think, is needed for us to produce local water through desalination projects in Moore Park, uh, Soma, Simi Valley area. And you're correct, Supervisor Parks, uh, that uh, uh, $38 or so was a, a deferral, but they added to uh, capital construction costs with the understanding that they have to come back and increase that rate anyway in the future to pay for that salinity management pipeline. My understanding is Cayegas will complete a detail, detailed analysis of the salinity management pipeline. 
we are also working with them to figure out how those costs should be distributed, who should be paying those costs. Should those costs be paid by all water purveyors, or should some of the costs should be paid for by the sanitation agencies who are benefiting from the salinity management pipeline? So that dialogue will be occurring in the next six to nine months. Uh, so I will be happy to report to you how that process is going. And, and I, I understand that you know they have a huge capital project coming forward, um, one that may not have been totally vetted uh, regarding the costs and, and letting folks know about it, but people out in Bell Canyon, and this is Waterworks District 17, I think the, where it goes to um, Supervisor Foy's district is with the Santa Susana Field Lab, right. uh, which is also part of that Waterworks District number 17. But I don't think either of them would have any receive any benefit from the brine line or salinity line that you refer to. Uh, the purpose of uh, the salinity management plan is to, a program is to potentially produce as much as 40,000 acre feet of local water. If in fact that were to happen within Ventura County, every customer within the service Cayuga service area will benefit because Cayugas does not have to purchase Tier 2 water from Metropolitan Water District. And also we are looking at a potentially constructing a Mopad desalter where we are working with Cayugas. We can distribute this water to Bell Canyon, for example, to Lake Sherwood, the districts that your board is responsible for. We are working with Cayugas to distribute this water to others. So I think it will benefit all of the service area. Thank you. And so uh, and when do you expect that we'll get more information about how they look at dispersing the costs? Uh, last time I spoke to the new general manager, uh, we were told it's going to be uh, six to nine months. And so you support this uh, changing the uh, surcharge for rate deferral and, and moving it into the capital construction because they're going to need those funds? I support it because of the future capital outlays they have to put out anyway to help us to produce local water. Thank you. So you said millions of dollars are going to be needed for the capital project. How many dollars do they have now? See, that's something that we are trying to find out, <laughs> exactly how much money they have already paid for. Uh, they have several bonds uh, that they have uh, gotten money from. Uh, and uh, we have asked for a detailed analysis of how much money has already been funded through these existing water rates and how much more is needed and who is going to be paying for those uh, future funds for the it's capital gonna, program. It's going to impact all our... our, our yes, sir. Our it is going to impact. And we are closely working with Cayugas. We are watching. We go to, I go to every board meeting to find out exactly what's going on with the financial situation for Cayugas. Yes. Um, I appreciate that discussion. I think we're obviously waiting for more information. But on the on the former thing, uh, before we change policies and go to email responses as uh, as you were requesting, I'd I need a lot more information before I'd support that policy change. So thank you. Supervisor, I do. A, uh, I know we talked also about this brine line, which is so critical. We have millions and millions of gallons every day that go down the creek above what the creek needs that we're just not we're not using I mean it's amazing how much water is is out there and so trying to get this water district to or Vegas to get their act together and get this done and I know it's an expensive time and it's hard on the backs of these people right now to pay for this and trying to find the money but at some point we get that done we can stabilize this water race throughout that uh, East County so hopefully it'll work out this is a public hearing and we have a request on uh, Mr. Collett if you'd like to have a seat. We'll have our public hearing at this time and see if there are any further questions on this item. And I would invite up um, Doug Sullivan, who wishes to speak to the board. Good morning. Good afternoon and uh, happy Thanksgiving Thank in you. the future. Um, a couple things. I'm not in the, um, the Bell Canyon District 17 water district. However, I'm in Waterworks, uh, Lake Shore Community Services District, which has provided water from the Ventura County Waterworks agencies. Uh, first thing, I'd like to applaud Reddy for his most recent uh, conservation efforts. Um, he was able to combine all the different water districts 
in, in the conservation efforts so we didn't have to pay the, the higher tier rates and, and so forth. What, what I worry about with this new 10% increase, um, I'm not against the 10% increase in the water rate if, if it's a pass-through completely. Um, the residents of all these water districts have, have made a big sacrifice in the last year in conserving water. We've all done a great job. I mean, my, wa my lawn's dead. My, wife's, my wife gets a water bill every month. She doesn't see how much we saved in water, and she gets excited. So we, we did our best. We, we drastically reduced our water at our house. We did our part, and I think a lot of other people have. Um, because of that, I think, I think the public should be rewarded. I think, I think we got to look at the water districts individually. There's five of them. They're, they're all part of the county water works agency. I've been doing research on it the last four or five months. I've come into Reedy's office three or four times and asked for some documents. And what's really hard to find out is what, what each water district spends on labor, manpower, this and that. I've looked at the financial reports for the county. It's very, very hard to find out those individual amounts of money for labor, bill collecting, all the, all the different stuff that affects each district. Now, the reason I ask that is each district, even though they're under the water works umbrella of the county of Ventura, they should be treated as independent government agencies as they're started by the state of California. Um, I, look, I looked into the audits, and the, the Lakeshore Community Services District hasn't been audited in almost two years, and it's required under state law. So what I'm asking is, if you're going to raise the rates 10% across the board for the people in District 17, shouldn't we look at the water district as a whole and see if there's other ways we can save money on how the water districts are, man, are managed in, inside? If that means cutting back manpower and moving that manpower to other parts of the county, other, other departments, not, not in the water works agencies, but other public works divisions, so be it without laying off people. But the, the ratepayers should, should be allowed to save money on their water if there's a way to save money. Not just be passed. If you're going to pass along 10%, that's fine. But if you don't have to by saving money in other areas, shouldn't we look at those other areas first before we start raising the water rates 10%? I mean, the people have done their best to save water. We've, we've, the the, the ratepayers... Have, have sacrifice. I think it's time that the government looks into itself and sacrifices also. That's what I'm here to ask. Okay. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. There are no further public request cards on this item. Mr. Piccolo? Yes, it is true that our office manages five different water districts. Uh, we pool uh, employees uh, within our office and uh, as a matter of fact, we have five water systems and seven sewer systems that we manage. Uh, we have operation maintenance staff uh, uh, that's used in different uh, districts. And uh, every time an employee works in a given district, they are given a charge number to charge to the district. As far as the District 17 is concerned, uh, about 14% of our total budget costs for operation maintenance of this district. And uh, regarding uh, whether we could reduce uh, uh, staffing uh, uh, with your continuous improvement process, your board has instituted, we have been looking at uh, continuously improving our process. Uh, next uh, water rate review for District 1, I will pre make a detailed presentation of where the costs are going, what type of improvements we have made so far. But what I can report to you today is we believe we are doing the best we can with the staff that we have absorbing additional tasks uh, within our department uh, and also adding on more systems, more facilities to our current workload. And I'll be happy to make a detailed presentation about how our staffing has not changed over a number of years in spite of the fact that we have more regulations, more systems added to our department. Uh, my, uh, my recommendation to you is at this time, uh, we believe we are doing the best we can with the staff that we have, and we are not spending any more money than what, what we need to do in District 17. So our recommendation is to uh, have your board recommend, uh, approve our staff recommendations. Okay, Mr. Cowell, thank you. Any other questions? There's a motion. Just, just a comment. Um, Mr. Sullivan makes good points, same points we made right. when we, we sat down and right. talked. So that presentation, you'll be coming back in the next few weeks? Is uh, December 14th is uh, Water Work District 1. Uh, okay. Water rate increase at that time, I'll make the presentation. Make sure. So, Mr. Sullivan, make sure you're here because that's part of what he's going to take some time to do. So that's great. I appreciate you doing that, Rene. I'll go ahead and uh, move the... Uh, Sorry, move. Sorry, already seconded. Oh, okay, well, then I'll go ahead and, and support that motion. <laughs> um, but I do say this is not a, um, 
you know, a, a clean pass through because they have, in my mind, they've added a little bit more for whatever it may be, but they, it isn't a clean pass through straight from Metropolitan. Okay. Okay, that item is approved for um, unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Picasso. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. Thank you. It's always difficult to come forward on rate increases, always. So our next item is uh, item 37, and it is a public hearing on adoption of the ordinance on the environmental health uh, solid waste requirements. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, board members, uh, Mrs. Robinson. I'm Bill Stratton with the Environmental Health Division. Um, the item before you is a public hearing to hear the proposal to amend the county ordinance code pertaining to the regulations of uh, uh, solid waste. Uh, the recommended action is to introduce and read in title only the attached ordinance amending provisions of the Ventura County Ordinance Code, uh, waive uh, further reading and continue the matter uh, for final adoption to December 7th, uh, 2010. Now, briefly, the, what brings us before your board today can actually be traced back to 1989 when the uh, state legislature enacted the Integrated Waste Management Act, which required cities and municipalities to reduce up to 50% of their waste stream from landfill disposal by the year 2000. Many jurisdictions uh, implemented curbside green waste or, or uh, residential yard waste uh, collection programs. Much of that material is processed into mulch to be used beneficially by the ag community as well as residential gardening to um, uh, suppress weeds, water saving, and to uh, improve soil structure. Uh, unfortunately, um, under certain conditions, mulch can become biolog biologically very active. And when that happens, we, as Chief Roper indicated, uh, we're looking at potential fire hazards, nuisance conditions that we deal with uh, for odors and flies, and an accumulation of solid waste um, from uh, the processing uh, that can build up over time. So the purpose of the ordinance, um, proposed ordinance before you, the amendments, um, are to allow and develop standards that will allow the use, the beneficial use of mulch uh, in agricultural operations, uh, while at the same time minimizing those potential fire hazards and nuisance conditions. And we're going to do this, and we're pro proposing two overarching issues that will accomplish this. One is by limiting the uh, application depth to 12 inches. Um, we have built in, based on uh, comments from the ag community, we've built in some flexibilities into this 12 inch requirement. Uh, it's an average, and that average takes into account uh, differences in types of equipment, application methods, topography, so we're not going out with a ruler and, and looking at 12 inches. It could be more depending on um, how it's, how it's uh, applied. There's also another flexibility built in where if a, an ag operation uh, for agronomic reasons needs to increase that depth to 24, 34 inches, 36, 4 feet, that's really uh, will be a determination made by the Agricultural Commissioner's Office. So there is a flexibility oh, as well as the fire division too, uh, fire protection district. So if someone wants to exceed that 12 inches, there is certainly um, uh, an avenue and, and flexibility in order for them to do that. Uh, the second issue is to deal with contaminants and the proposed ordinance will limit the amount of contaminants in mulch to a 0.1% by volume. Um, I, I should say that many, most, well, all of the mulch producers in this county produce a very high quality mulch. Um, what this attempts to do is, is address some of that material that's coming in from other counties, other cities outside of Ventura County, uh, which may not have the same high standards that uh, some of our local mulch producers uh, impose on themselves. Um, I want to note that the proposed amendments do not affect property owners that produce green material, process green material, and use that green material on their own property. So they are not subject to this uh, ordinance amendment. Nor will there be any permit requirements from the Environmental Health Division um, for anyone who wants to use mulch 
uh, within these standards, uh, and we're not going to uh, impose any or have any um, mandatory inspection frequencies. We are going to make two changes that were brought to our attention most recently, one by the Agricultural Commissioner's Office, uh, and that is in the Section 4704. We will make sure we bring this, uh, make these changes uh, and bring it to your board December 7th. But basically it's a word change. We're changing one word uh, from um, necessary to beneficial um, in 4704. And just this morning it was brought to our attention in the definition of agricultural land. Uh, there was a bit of confusion and it was a holdover from numerous iterations of this ordinance that we've been working on for months. So we are going to make a, uh, a small non-substitute change to uh, Section 4701-2. and We'll bring that before your board as well. Uh, in conclusion, I would like to um, let you know this was a, a collaborative effort between the Environmental Health Division, uh, the Fire Protection District, and the a commissioner's office. Um, we also received, and I want to acknowledge and thank the numerous stakeholders that we met with during this process, um, the Farm Advisor, Farm Bureau, uh, state and local agencies, our own Public Works Agency, uh, Planning Division, as well as um, Agrimen, Lyman Era, and Waste Management. We also brought this item before the uh, Ag uh, Ag Policy Advisory Committee. Um, so those are the stakeholders that we met with during this process. That concludes my comments, and I'm available for questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Stratton. Questions? Um, yeah, the change that was made to 4701-2, was that the open space, open space land can be considered agriculture land if the Agriculture Commissioner deems that? That, that's correct. What we're doing is, is removing any reference to open space and land in LCA contracts. Um, and it will read, second sentence, the parcels designated OS may be considered ag land upon written evaluation and approval of the ag commissioner. So we're removing, there was a, a confusion by calling out open space and LCA contracts. Um, so is the, what, could you tell me what the benefit is of having it considered agriculture land instead of open space land? Well, our purpose of this ordinance was not to preclude the beneficial use of mulch on any properties, regardless of how it was zoned or how it was identified. Um, what we're attempting to do is, is identify and have a nexus between an ag use and mulch being brought in from being brought onto these properties. Um, without this ag nexus, and, and this is where we're going to rely on the Agricultural Commissioner's Office, is that we're not, we're trying to avoid illegal disposal because some property owners are paid to receive this material. Um, so we're trying to avoid some type of illegal disposal under the guise of agriculture uh, and where we run into these problems. So. The zoning for us isn't as important as how this material is handled once it becomes on the, comes on the property. So for in order for this to uh, have your, your mulch designation on open space land, um, it would go to the Ag Commissioner to say that that works for them. And their basis will be, yes, it's really being used for um, mulching purposes, not just to store or be a dump or something? That, that's correct. Okay. Regardless of what that use is, we'll leave that up to the Ag Commissioner's Office. If they're going to grow cattle or crops, it's, it's really they need to make that argument with the Ag Commissioner's Office. And, and uh, what kind of criteria do you think they'll be looking at? I don't know. Okay. I think we do have a representative from the Ag Commissioner's Office here today. Supervisor Zaragoza. Um, the question I have on the <clears throat> new standard for the 0 0.1 contamination, what is the current standard? What is the current percentage on that? Well, there is, uh, there is no current standard per se. A lot of people in the industry refer to a 1% by weight allowance, um, and, and that comes from for operations that produce mulch, 
They're allowed to have up to 1% contaminant by weight coming into their operation. Um, a lot of people have just kind of passed that through and said, well, if it's 1% coming in, then they can have 1% in the product itself. Is this 1% or 0.1%? Or well, what we're proposing is 0.1%, a tenth of a percent. One tenth yes. of them. And I should say, I'd like to point out that the mulch producers in this county have told us when we met with them they can meet that standard, and they are meeting that standard. Realistic standard. Yeah, absolutely. Agrimen especially said they can meet that standard. And, and the other question I have, how is that going to, is that going to hinder the city curbside uh, waste collections for the, for the cities? Or are they going to be able to meet that? Currently in Ventura County, all of, well, all the whether or not they can meet their diversion standards. No, um, not, not diversion, the, the contamination. Contamination standards, that will be up to the facility that receives the curbside green waste and processes Not the that material. About the, uh, the receivers of the, uh, of the material. Yes, they, they should be able to meet that requirement. That's correct. And, and the agency say it is realistic that 0 0.01 contamination. 0 0.1 contamination. Point, yeah, point one That's correct. Yeah. That's quite a difference from the 1%. From the one percent by weight that's allowed to go into the yeah. into the facility, it re, what this basically comes down to is a producer of mulch will have to perhaps put it through another process or a screening process to remove additional contaminants, contaminants. plastics, glass mm -hmm. from from that finished product. Yeah. What happens over time, unfortunately, if you do have these contaminants in this mulch material, is as the material breaks down, these plastics, glass are left in place. Mm -hmm. okay. Questions here? Thank you. Yeah, I, have, I have three questions. Number one, how does the ordinance treat sewage sludge? The ordinance, this ordinance is, this, the amendments to this ordinance is specific to mulch. Okay, so it's silent it's, on? So, well, mulch is, or, or excuse me, sewage sludge is, um, the regulations for the application of sewage sludge are handled under the federal Code of Federal regula Regulations. So this hasn't changed our This has not right. changed. And then how about manure? Manure, um, there's a provision in here that in one of the sections that talks about material other than mulch. Right. So there's a provision in here where if there's a manure being stored on a, a property and it's creating nuisance conditions, um, we can consult with the A Commissioner's Office and determine what's the best step best action to take. So we're still dealing with flies and odor conditions, nuisance conditions. Okay. And then uh, how is this ordinance enforced? How do you guys go about it? Well, for, for like I mentioned, there's no permit requirements here. for So for the Environmental Health Division, it's complaint driven. Okay. So it is complaint driven. Complaint right. driven. So you'd go out and investigate if there was a If complaint. we get a complaint. Now, it, the, the follow-up to that is enforcement. Let's say we find something. All of our um, enforcement activities rely on voluntary compliance, so we're going to work with the property owner to spread the piles uh, and do what it takes to to eliminate that potential hazard. And then on uh, 4701-2, the conversion of open-spaced agricultural land, you know, based on the designation of the Agricultural Commissioner, based on your explanation, it, it seems to me that the criteria is the Agricultural Commissioner is verifying this is a legitimate ag operation. That's correct. Right. That's what you and what's what you think the criteria is. That's correct. So my question is, why wouldn't we just say that? Why wouldn't we just say, you know, the parcels designated OS without an LCA contract may be considered agricultural land upon the written evaluation and approval of the Agriculture Commission commissioner that the that it is a legitimate ag operation or a legitimate use of mulch in an ag operation? Then, then you wouldn't have any. You know, five years from now, anybody wondering what what criteria is the ag commissioner supposed to? Well, that, that's a good uh, suggestion. That we, we felt that was implied by having them to go to the ag commissioner's office to get authorization mm -hmm. to do that. But we're certainly willing to I incorporate that. Board members have any problems with that? If that's uh, that's what they're. That, they're that sounds good. Yeah. You know, and I think also uh, the not to interrupt you, Supervisor Bennett, uh, the composting facilities. Uh, I think about the worm concern that was out in the Tierra Hada Valley at one point that was uh, disturbing neighbors. So uh, open space lots can be 10 acres, you know, and, mm -hmm. and then you could have 
you know, residents nearby. I'm just wondering if this will have the effect of increasing the um, potential incompatibility of uses. Would uh, it, it could. I, I think anytime you bring mulch or compost on a piece of property, you, you, there are there are potential nuisance conditions that can be created. With this ordinance, what we're trying to do is identify a framework or some standards under which that you can use, beneficially use this material, and hopefully, what we think, not create fire hazards in these nuisance conditions. It all comes down to management, how you manage this material when it comes on the property. But um, isn't it correct that the AE zone has a larger minimum lot size than the open space zone? I'm not familiar with that. Isn't, uh, I thought... Good morning, for the record, Chris Stevens. And yes, the uh, minimum lot size in the AE zone is 40 acres. Minimum lot size in open space is 10. So it will, I guess that then gets me to, well, ex extending this to open, all open space zone land, essentially, even if the Ag Commissioner says it is for an agricultural use, um, may end up with large piles of mulch next to, you know, you might have more chances for incompatibility, I guess. And I'm thinking about, you know, areas where you have these 10-acre estate lots all over and someone may want to make some money and, you know, just store, you know, chip things in there. Yeah, no, that that's correct. And, and, and um, that is one of the reasons that uh, we want to refer them to the Agricultural Commissioner's Office. And there's language and in the later section, uh, 4704, D2, which kind of, um, which is on the top of page 15, that refers to the uh, Ag Commissioner finding that it does not pose a public safety risk, which would include anything nuisance related, such as odor, I think in that category, and that it is beneficial, agronomically beneficial. So we're hopeful that those standards will be workable. If, in fact, they prove not to be, uh, we may be back before you with some sort of an amendment, but at this point in time, we think out the gate, that that's a reasonable place to start. Mm -hmm. I would think it, as it stands where you, it, it is almost an a, a incentive towards going into the LCAs. You know, if you do that, then, you know, we're going to let you go ahead and have mulch operation on your property if you want. Extending it further to any open space lot, even while it may not have a particular odor or stuff, it, it may have a visual impact, you know, thinking about the Reagan Library looking over properties that are 10 acres with big mulch. I don't know. It just seems yeah. to me that it does have some potential negative um, impacts to neighboring properties when you get down to the 10 acre size and you have these large mulch piles. Yeah, yeah the, the, the definition of agriculture is really used only in reference to the exception. Uh, one thing to point out. The, the other is the, the reference to the open space uh, was really, I think, in, in, in deference to the fact that there are active irrigated orchards in open space designated land, and we didn't want to simply preclude the use of mulch in a beneficial manner in those areas. That was really the primary reason for doing uh, coming up with the language that we did. Okay, and, and I, I thought this was for um, mulch operations, not necessarily for... No, it's for no, 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 just, okay. just application. Okay, any other questions? Yes, we do have public speakers on this. If you have a seat, please, I'll call up the public speakers uh, and open the uh, public hearing on this. And that uh, first, Marty Melvin. I don't see him. Um, Oli DeGorish, did he stick around for this one? He didn't either. Nelson Summers did. <laughs> Good morning again, Mr. Summers. Good morning. All right. Um, first, uh, brushing on the standards for uh, litter in the material, 1%, 0.1% volume, uh, you know, by weight. I don't know exactly what that really means. Now, does that mean, like, as I speak right now, I probably have six guys at our ranch out with the little picking up tools going around and picking up mulch, putting it into a bucket, putting it into a skip loader, taking it and dumping it into a roll-off that we'll take to a landfill. So what does this mean as far as uh, what if the mulch comes in and it's 
say it's 0.5% trash, but I pick up the trash as the stuff decomposes, more trash shows. We send the guys in, they're picking up the trash out of the mulch. Um, does that mean if, if, if we receive some of this material, all of a sudden I become a, a, a disposal site? If I get, what's the violation going to be? Another concern that I have is uh, the public nuisance point. Um, if you have a neighbor that for some reason you don't get along good, for instance, say maybe you bought a piece of property that one of the former owners was... Uh, had an agitation he didn't want to sell but five of the people in the family wanted to sell the ranch and he still lives in the neighborhood and all of a sudden he starts making phone calls to the county oh this guy's a nuisance I have flies I can smell the material coming in this seems like all the public nuisance part of this uh, is going to do is uh, give more teeth to to people to, to fight against farming and farming's under attack right now as I'm sure you're well aware of we're going through changes to the grading ordinance getting rid of HECO permits and and different things that are that are put in to make it easy for ranchers because ranchers just don't have cubicle after cubicle of people working in offices to be able to be here like I am right now I've got 30 employees right now that hopefully they're you know under control and somebody's paying attention to what's going on while well, I'm down here worrying about something to where it could, you know, end up being really difficult for me to deal with later on because a public, I don't want to be a public nuisance, but I realize that if you have houses here and farming here, no matter how you cut it, farmers are a public nuisance because the people don't want to smell manure. If you bring in, for instance, there used to be Egg City, which was up there by Moore Park, and you could smell it all the way to Fillmore. People used to put chicken manure on, and the and the and the people would just go ballistic that lived anywhere next to a ranch because it was horrible. And it does; it's pretty rough to smell. But that's part of farming. Farming, you have to be able to put stuff back into the ground to get the crops to produce. You can't just use all chemical farming. And the people want organic farming. They don't want chemicals pumped onto the ground. We have regulations. Worrying about monitoring the runoff that comes off of the ranches. I mean, how are you going to monitor the runoff? They won't allow them to clean the creeks and the ditches and the rivers out. So the ditches run through the properties. When it goes, like in the 05 flood, we have 350 acres down by Hopper Canyon Road where Hopper Creek ran through our ranch four or five feet deep. And they want to monitor the runoff that comes out of the ditch when it takes half of your topsoil away when there's a flood. It's just they keep putting little straws on top of the camel's back, and eventually the camel's back is going to snap. They put in regulations that say, oh, it's a green belt. They'll never go to houses. You have to farm. But if they keep regulating farmers to the point where farmers no longer have, uh, have an ability to do it, it's going to be, it'll end up being where the ranches just go, and it turns into just an armpit out there is what it'll turn into, of little ranches with, a couple of horses and weeds and it won't be a viable beautiful farming operation like what it's been for the last hundred years here that's what I'm really concerned about so I don't know exactly what point one percent looks like I don't even know what it would be I've never had anybody I just got brought into the picture on this last uh, last week is when I first knew about all these changes and it needs to be completely studied I need to see what it looks like a truckload of material dumped out with one with a 0.1%, so I know what it is. I don't, I've never seen anybody lay it out onto an area where I can actually visualize 0.1% or what 1% is. I know that ranchers don't like trash. That's why we have guys out picking trash up every single day. But, uh, and you know, as far as the depth of the application and all that, it's, it's a lot of different things happen on our ranch that might not happen on the ranch down the road. I mean, there's different ways to to do a business, and one rancher might do it one way, or one rancher might do it another way, and it's it needs to be looked into, but I really think that we need to start watching out what's going on with uh, all the rules and how much stuff's going on towards the farmers, because if Thank they keep you, hitting these farmers, pretty soon we're going to seen all of our food coming in from foreign countries and I don't know if that's something that
is a good thing for the people here. So thank you, anyway, Mr. I just want to thank you. Thank you. All right. I appreciate thank your you. comments. Can I ask you a question? question? Mr. Summers, yeah. can I ask you a question real quick? Um, one of the things that we're proposing here is the maximum storage of 12 months. How much time do you need for this to, to the mulch to become usable after you bring it in and do that? Oh, we can immediately start using it, but if you get into a rain event or if a flood comes through like it did in 05 where it demolishes your ranch, and you can see you have a pile of mulch that's ready to go on you know, right now, it might be something that you delay. You might move the pile and turn it over and kind of spread it out and work it. That's why we have the equipment, so we can deal with the, anything that comes up like that. So the 12 months is not a problem? Shouldn't be a problem, no. We try to move it as quick as possible. Okay, so that, that's one of the things. And uh, So the same thing with six months that prior to application of other properties if you're making mulch. That, that, that works okay for you? Yeah, that works fine. I just don't know about the public nuisance part of it and the, the no, I, okay, 1% by volume. I don't know what that is exactly, the 0.1%. Yeah, so. I agree. Trying to visualize that's pretty tough. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Or? Yeah, no, Madam Chair, you know, I, that's, uh, that was the reason I asked on that 0.1% over 0.5 or what's the rationale or the science behind that that numbers. And I probably have the same question that uh, Mr. Summers has, you know, why, why, why 0.1 as opposed to 0.5 or how do we come up with that number? Because it's one-tenth of what... One percent. You know, well, well, I okay. might point out one of the reasons we came up with that number is because all of the local providers said that they they could meet that. That's they, what I wanted to so, find out, and yeah. I think that's what Mr. Summers. Was yeah, to but I mean, I'm, I'm saying in the testimony from staff, they said they checked with everybody, and everybody said yes. But, that they, the local providers. I see. The problem is, is other people use material brought in by waste management. It's not all agrimen that's used in the county. We use a lot from waste management. We produce our own material in Ojai, and we sell it to the people in Ojai, which is beautifully clean. You can always tell where the material comes from. If it comes from Oxnard, might be more trash in it than it does from Ojai. <laughs> or, or vice versa. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> There's always a lot. You can always really, you can almost tell where the green waste comes from just by looking at the material. I was in charge of curbside okay. green waste in Oxnard, so I know it's clean. Mr. Summers, thank, thank you. I right. appreciate your comments. If we could now bring this back to staff and... Um, we, Move we ahead here on the item. Uh, Did you have any other? Uh, no, the other speakers <laughs> aren't here. So we're done with public speakers. We'll close the uh, public hearing at this time. It's back to the board now. So if there's any yeah. comments to add uh, from staff. I just want to ask for a Yes. Let's go back to this visualizing 0.01%. But besides what happens here, what are other counties doing in this situation? I mean, is this, a, is this typical in other counties? Do you have any idea? Well, I know in Kern County they're struggling with this issue, but they started with biosolids a number of years ago, and it's kind of uh, transitioned over now to um, mulch and green material, green waste coming into the county. Uh, in one discussion I had with uh, my counterpart in, in Kern County, they were very interested in what we were putting together because we're kind of leading the charge here. Um, everyone is, at least on the LEA level, is struggling with uh, green material, beneficial use of mulch, and what is an acceptable contaminant level, and, and how do you handle this material? Um, so, the, so to answer your question, I know Kern County is looking at um, an ordinance. I don't know what other counties have done. Right. So we don't have a comparison to see if this this level um, is is correct. I mean, it seems like it's almost 100 percent pure. And, and the problem is, I'm sure they'd love to buy it all pure or get it all pure if they could, but uh, he made some pretty good points as it starts to decay and do something, they're picking more out, they're picking more out. How do you know you can get down? And, and how do you, how would you know to say, yes, mine is 1%, one tenth of a percent, two percent? How would you know that? Well, for us, if we get the complaint, and I, it's a couple things that Mr. Somers mentioned, and, and maybe I can clarify this. He talked about, um, receiving material that may be at a 5% or to 1% or 2%, whatever that happens to be, and is he immediately in violation of this, this ordinance? Remember, our involvement in this is, will be uh, complaint-driven. So if Mr. Summers receives a load that he feels is contaminated or, or has a lot of this material in it, he has employees out there that's pulling this material out. So I don't see that as a, as a strict violation of this ordinance because it's being addressed. Voluntary compliance, he's working on that. Um, 
with respect to how do you measure the, the point 1%, there's a couple different, and this isn't going to be scientific in any way, shape, or form for us in our inspectors when we go out in the field, a couple different ways we can do it. You can do it visually with a, with a screen, a grid, and, and look at, well, there's three pieces here, the same area over here, how many pieces of, of trash or other material do I see? Another way is you can, you can haul buckets. You can get ten buckets and, and fill them up and, and empty them out and see if you can fill up a tenth of a bucket uh, with the remaining trash. Um, I, I should mention that in our discussions with the Farm Advisor and APAC, they were very concerned about any contaminants in mulch, contaminant levels in mulch coming into Ventura County because it can affect the, the value and the quality of, the, of their crops. So they were very concerned about that. So is point one overly uh, restrictive? Well, according to the, the, the uh, ag community the representatives that we talked to, it didn't appear to be overly restrictive. But, but, but you know, the, uh, the receiver, the transfer station operator can reject the load too if it's contaminated to a, a certain point visually. The, the receiver at the transfer station, the person that's receiving this material, that's correct. Well, they, they can have receive waste that's extremely contaminated. They put them into a different permit tier. They have spawners in the transfer station that's, that can spot those loads. That's correct. Yeah. Right. I, I should point out, too, that uh, another comment that was raised by the, by the uh, um, Farm Bureau was there are some impending... Uh, trash TMDLs that are being discussed, and if they haven't been imposed, they're soon to be imposed. Um, so it, it kind of goes back to this, you know, how much contaminants do you want to be bringing into uh, farm properties uh, in the form of mulch or mixed in with mulch um, if you have another state agency that's dealing with a zero tolerance for trash TMDLs in creeks and rivers. So. Yeah, I, I agree with you on there. I, I think that's, that's right. I guess I'm just trying to find this balance that if we make this so restrictive that it costs us so much to produce this stuff, somebody else will I'll just buy it someplace else because I, you know, it's too expensive to do it here. Uh, and, and, if nobody, and then we're, then we're also bringing in something else that may not even have a 1% or 2 or 3%. And so that's where I'm trying to find the balance. I mean, uh, hopefully we have it as pure as pure can be. But I... I it's just I don't want to be in a position because if it becomes complaint, it's interesting. I saw something on a, the other day, somebody talked about a complaint, where they were looking to go to a two complaint before anybody could do anything because of exactly what he said, neighbors and all this other stuff. There had to be at least two people complaining to, to do that. Um, and, I, and I guess, like you said, this is probably self police because most of these landowners and farmers are not going to want anything that has any contaminants, and they're going to buy from the people who do a good job. I guess I'm just trying to find that balance that we just don't put somebody out of business or something happens that, boom, this guy, I don't know. Uh, another way to, that we kind of looked at this is, unintentionally, I guess, is we've created this safe harbor, if you will, for uh, owners of property who want to use this material. We've identified these standards where if you, if you use it in such a way that there, there shouldn't be any issues associated. Keep in mind that when you're in this safe harbor, we do have a right to farm ordinance in here. And I, the Agricultural mm -hmm. Commissioner's Office can speak to that mm -hmm. better than I can. But if this is a legitimate ag operation and there may be odors and, and other issues associated with that, well, that is allowed and addressed in the right to farm ordinance that we have. So, Madam Chair, if, if, if I could, one, I, I, um, I appreciate staff leadership in this area is, is sort of consistent with where, where Ventura County has been a lot on, on, on a lot of issues. And I think that uh, with the higher standards coming in, we need to find some way to, to start using more of this mulch. And, and so I think staff's done, done good work on this. The fact that ag wants really clean mulch, yeah, I think, is, is, is important for us to note here. You know, and so we should set the standard um, high and, and, and one that we're comfortable with. I think that um, I checked with, uh, b before we came to the hearing, because I wanted to know, it says that you know we got input from Limonera, Agrimen, and Waste Management. I, I mentioned Mr. Summers talked about Waste Management. All of them indicated they had no objections with the standard. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we just have one or 
we're you know we got three major producers that say yes we can we, we can live with this mm -hmm. this standard. So I think from the standard standpoint, we ought to at least try it. If we have a problem, you know, staff can come back. We can change the standard if there's some egregious thing. But we ought to start with a standard that they all say they can meet, and that comes closest to where ag wants us to be, which is to have a real high standard for this, so they don't have the contaminants in their soil. Two, with regards to the issue of enforcement, I think environmental health. Number one, this is complaint driven, so nobody's going to be sitting there checking every every load and then saying, hey, you know, you're now in violation. Two, environmental health, I think, has been uh, extremely reasonable in working with people. They're trying to, you know, they, they would say, hey, you know, you, you got a dirty load. What are we going to, you know, what, what can be done about it? Do we contact the, the provider? Let's get this solved. But they just haven't seen environmental health go and, 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 and be unreasonable. They're going to try to work with people to make that happen. And then um, with regard to the comment about the, about the public nuisance, um, I think the same thing has been true. We do have a right to farming ordinance. Um, it, it is only when it's when environmental health has a, has reasonable standards for what a public nuisance is, not just because a, a neighbor has a, has a particular complaint. So, uh, I think it's uh, appropriate. And when we finish the discussion, I'd like to talk about this one language for the addition to the motion. I, you know, I want to work quickly, but I think you know Oxnard has probably the best green waste there is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I thought we heard different. <laughs> Could, could I? Uh, okay, could I, let's. Uh, are we finished? I, let's move ahead. Yeah, could I then uh, make the motion to approve staff's recommended action with the one change? And I'll uh, just ask County Council, is it appropriate to actually add this language to the end of uh, the paragraph uh, section 4701 2, the, the, uh, at the end of that? Uh, yes, that would be appropriate. Okay, so it would say, upon the written evaluation and approval of the Ag Commissioner, and then it would be this language that the mulch is being appropriately used as part of a legitimate agricultural operation. I'll repeat that, that the mulch is being appropriately used as part of a legitimate agricultural operation. I think that clarifies that criteria. And um, just a question: um, Is that uh, on site, Speci or can they just be doing it for off-site? I guess. I guess that would go to staff. Is well, that would. I think that would call, fall under the category of appropriate. You know, if the ag commissioner. That's, um, I don't so know how to. Oh, I was just wondering if the ordinance applies to those operations that are just mulching operations using some land but not using it on site. Does this apply to that situation it, too? It applies to property owners, ag properties, any properties that want to land apply mulch. On, not, on site? On, on their properties. So yes. could it, would it be appropriate then to tag that on, with on site? That the mulch is and, and the reason I'm saying that is going to these now ten potentially ten acre lots that they can be you know a business of storing this um, instead of actually using it for agricultural operations on site. That the mulch is being appropriately used as part of a legitimate agricultural operation on site. Yes. Anybody have a problem with that? Staff, work for you. It's what it's you're really intending, right? Clear, County Council. Yes, thank you, Supervisor Bennett. Can I add one thing? Uh, just because I thought staff had a, a modification to the first part of this sentence, and I, I just want to be clear that the sentence comes back on the second reading exactly as. Well, weren't you going to delete uh, without? Uh, we're talking about the second sentence. Yeah. Yes, we're going to delete without an LCA contract from that second sentence. Okay, so two changes to that sentence. Correct, and just so the you know, Great. it that's comes back clarity. exactly the way. You so I make that part of the motion also. Right. Yes, yeah. that's part of staff's recommendation to, to read. To read. Okay. okay. Anything else? There's a motion with that revision on that section. I appreciate Mr. Summers' uh, comments. I think yep. they're, they're good, the rational, reasonable things for us to, to consider. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and that passes as a first read, so please introduce and read title only the attached ordinance. 
An ordinance of the Ventura County Board of Supervisors amending provisions of the Ventura County Ordinance Code pertaining to the regulation of solid waste. Okay, thank you. And then that will be back to us on December 7th. And thank you to our speakers. Oh, that's right. And that meeting will be in Santa Paula at 7 p.m. This will be on at 7 p.m. Okay, that wraps up that item. Now we'll move. It's December 7th in Santa Paula? Santa Paula, yeah. Okay. I appreciate the discussion. I think that the work that we did on that helped the ordinance. So thank you. Okay, item 38. Camarillo Airport, parallel taxiway construction project. Good morning, Madam Chair, Supervisors, Ms. Robinson. I'm Todd McNamee, your Director of Airports. Before I get started, I just want to say that both Camarillo and Oxnard Airports are both beautiful airports. Not one better than the other. Thank you. So, but this item is for Camarillo Airport. The item is a mitigated negative declaration for a parallel taxiway that we wish to construct, most likely this next summer. It's to meet safety requirements in terms of object-free areas for wingtip clearance for some of the larger jets that we have coming and going from Camarillo Airport. Once they exceed 500 annual operations, they become what's called the critical aircraft in the FAA's eyes. The airport used to be protected to what's known as a Group 3 wingspan airport, and that's what we're going back to from a Group 2 that we did an amendment back in 2003 to our master plan. Just a quick review of our public process. This project itself was covered in our planning advisory committee meetings when we did the master plan update that shows this parallel taxiway with city representatives from Camarillo, including city council members, and they were all supportive of the project itself. And so this is our CEQA review for the project. Of course, then we go through the normal CEQA review with agencies and public review. Also went through our Aviation Advisory Commission and Airport Authority, both unanimously recommended adoption. And now, of course, today the public hearing with your board. The mitigation measures, I'm sorry these are a little bit difficult to read. The first three really have to do with air pollution and it's basically summarizes that we'll meet the requirements of APCD for normal construction projects, fugitive dust, things like that. Of course, we incorporate those into all of our construction projects anyways. The first at the bottom, Bio 1, is if we can't do the construction outside of a nesting season, then we monitor for nests in the open areas on the airport. We already do that now, actually, when we're mowing those infields between taxiways and runway environment. So that shouldn't be a problem for us. And then on the next page, we continue specifically watching out for burrowing owls, and we do occasionally walk now for burrowing owl nests as they're a migratory bird that like to visit our open space at our airports. And then as we get into the geo recommendations, it's really soil stabilization, which of course we have to do just as part of our construction of a taxiway anyways to support the aircraft. And last but not least is a mitigation measure to make sure we're not negatively impacting the Camarillo Hills drain that runs north and west of the airport, and we see no issue with that at all. And we'll of course monitor those through our mitigation monitoring plan as we go forward. And that's the staff report. Okay. Any questions? Okay. This, as was said, went through both the advisory and the authority and was approved. It's a motion to approve. Okay. There's a motion to approve. And a second. Please vote. And that was approved. Thank you. Thank you. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, too. Okay. Now we're to our 1130 time certain. Sorry. We've been busy this morning. So we'll call up our chief probation officer, Mark Varela, to introduce this exciting item. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Madam Chair, members of the board, Ms. Robinson, I have some copies of the PowerPoint that I will... Thank you for the opportunity to come before the board today to give you an update on jail alternatives here in Ventura County. So I'm assuming it's the right click there. There we go. Okay, these are the items I'd like to cover in the presentation today. I'll give you a status update on the three items that were recommended to this board by our consultants. That is our pretrial supervised release program that I will refer to as pretrial from here on out 
our work furlough short-term commitment program, which will be referred to as short-term, and uh, adult day reporting. Uh, as part of the objectives to, for today's presentation, I'm going to re uh, respectfully request that you, you authorize to establish a home detention and electronic monitoring program for low-risk, medically fragile sentenced inmates. Uh, also to approve our home detention electronic monitoring program policies, rules and regulations, and related program fees. And to adopt a resolution authorizing uh, short-term inmates to participate on work crews. So I'm going to try to uh, manage my time because I know I'm into lunchtime now. I'm going to give you a little history of how we got to this, uh, this place. There were a series of three jail sessions that are jail study sessions that were done to address the overcrowding in our adult facilities. Our main jail here located on this campus and our Todd Road facility out going out towards Santa Paula. Uh, the first jail study session was held in July of 2008. The second one was in September 2008 and the third one was in August of uh, I believe 2009. Um, as part of the discussions in these jail study sessions were to look at uh, alternatives to custody. Consultants were hired, that was Kraut and Sida, uh, that were hired to work with the probation agency to put together an adult master plan. And as part of the adult master plan, which was, which was done in conjunction with our partner justice agencies, was to come up with some ideas for ways that we can help the jail with the overcrowding issues. And three of the suggestions that were made by the consultants included pretrial, short term, and the establishment of adult reporting center. Uh, as you may or may not know, pretrial has, uh, has been fully implemented in our county back in the latter part of September 2009. We're putting, putting our final touches on our short term commitment program uh, with, with an expe expected implementation uh, date in January of next year. And our adult uh, day reporting idea or program was put on hold, we decided to go in a little bit different direction and I'll explain that as we get to that, uh, that part of the presentation. So the first I'm going to, I'm going to start with our pretrial program and um, it, this was a new venture for the probation agency. We've, we've done a lot of work in terms of uh, working with electronic monitoring programs for juvenile offenders so this was the first time we had an opportunity to do with the adults. It's modeled after a Santa Cruz County program which required us to take a field trip up to Santa Cruz and, and talk to some of the uh, professionals that run that particular program. And what we're really targeting is those post arraignment low risk adult inmates who have uh, not been released on their own recognizance and have, have, did not have the ability to post bail. Uh, we're implementing an evidence-based risk assessment to ID, ID suitable candidates, suitable participants for the program. And those that we feel are suitable for the program, we return back to court, place them on the court's calendar. Ultimately, they are approved by the court. If approved by the court, they're supervised closely by our probation officers on electronic monitoring. Some uh, uh, include GPS monitoring as well. And there is a very low tolerance for program violations. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Just to give you some statistics associated with pretrial, again it began the latter part of September 2009. Uh, now these, these statistics run all the way up to the end of July, July 31st of this year. We've screened 965 potential candidates for pretrial and since that period we've had 71 uh, released on to pretrial. They went through the whole process and were court approved to put into the program. Of the 71, we've had 40 that have successfully completed uh, the program without any incident, which means program uh, rule violations and their case has been concluded or terminated in some fashion. Approximately 50% of the uh, participants in the program have either uh, obtained or maintained employment during their time in the pretrial program, which is beneficial. They're still allowed to, to provide for their households and themselves. We've had 18 return to custody for violation of program rules. 13 of the 18 were on technical violations. The majority of violations that we've had as part of the program have been related to substance abuse. And there have been some participants that have uh, left their residence uh, without prior approval or have returned back late, which is a, a violation of the program rules and they were returned to custody. Four absconded, which means that they 
were placed on pretrial and left, either cut their bracelet off or just decided not to participate and left. Uh, we put the matters quickly back on the calendar, requesting a warrant. Warrant was issued, and they were brought to custody in a relatively short period of time. And there has been one rearrest for misdemeanor drug offense, and that's a, a violation of 11550 of the Health and, uh, and Safety Code, which is under, being under the influence of a controlled substance. On a side note, I heard yesterday that we have um, another seven by the end of this month that will have completed the program successfully. So that's, that's encouraging. A little bit more about pretrial. Uh, if you compare our performance over the last year with uh, there are similar programs in, in, in the country, and is, especially in Santa Cruz, we're right about at the same in terms of rate of absconding and reoffense. Uh, our technical violations are higher. Uh, we closely monitor everybody on pretrial, and we have a very low tolerance for program violations, and it has resulted in, in, in more people coming back into custody as a result. Interestingly, we, we have expanded pretrial. At the court's request, we were asked to take a look at monitoring those uh, adult sentence inmates that are considered to be medically fragile, which means that there is, uh, they're suffering from some pretty serious condition. We've had uh, sentenced adults refer to pretrial for conditions such as uh, aggressive forms of cancer, uh, staph infection, communicable diseases, and paralysis. Uh, these folks are typically pretty difficult to manage in our, in, in, in our custody facilities. So at the court's request, we have put them on pretrial. Again, we've had uh, 16 of them placed on pretrial, and we've had some, um, some success at getting, uh, managing them in the community after their, their sentence and, and having them uh, follow the terms and conditions of probation and the program rules. Also, uh, we have expanded to include 36 work furlough inmates. These are uh, people who typically would not have been accepted into work furlough, which is a minimum security facility, unless there was a greater uh, ability to monitor them in the community. And now with our GPS available to us, and we're able to supervise them through our pretrial. So we've had 36 folks that have been accepted into the program on those conditions. Now, what does that mean in terms of uh, jail bed days? Uh, again, we've had 123 total inmate releases. If you consider pretrial, uh, work furlough, and the medically fragile inmates, uh, which has added up to a total of 7,905 uh, uh, bed days as of October 31st of this year. And starting when? Is uh, this is starting the latter part of September 2009, so a little bit over a year. And what this really does is create additional space for higher risk inmates in our local jails. Um, now that reentry is, is a big topic, especially in, in, in our communities here, and having more inmates released from state prison facilities, some on supervision, some not, um, it, this creates more bed space for those higher risk inmates if they happen to come back into our system. Do you have um, the same kind of statistics for the medically fragi fragile? Yeah, I'm going to get down to talking okay. a little bit about the medically fragile okay. down on this slide here. Um, the cost savings that we've had for the medically fragile, and this, this includes other folks in pretrial, but primarily the medical fragile has, uh, with that population, because of their medical conditions, there have been 13 emergency room visits, one by ambulance, six surgeries, and 18 days of inpatient hospitalization. And we don't know the exact cost because we don't have access to the, to the medical records to determine how much money. Our, our, our medical provider at the jail contracted up to $15,000 of medical services. Anything uh, in excess of $15,000 comes out of the county, county funds. So um, it has been pretty uh, successful when, it, when we come to, to dealing with those folks that have the medical conditions. I would think you'd have like a 100% successful completion as opposed to the ones that you that weren't that you described were cutting off their bracelets or anything. Yeah, and, and and I don't know exactly. Have we had any completions? We've had completions and all we'll have completed successfully. So. so I'm gonna switch gears here and talk about the second recommendation, custody alternative recommendation. That is the short-term commitment program. This again was another recommendation from our consultants, Kraut and Sida. Uh, and work furlough traditionally has operated to work furloughs available for low-risk inmates 
uh, serving 30 days or more on a jail sentence. And what we decided to do is look at those on the serving anywhere from three to 45 days and look at possibly mon uh, modifying our program to accept those lower risk prisoners, again, to alleviate the, the overcrowding conditions in our local jails. The focus of, of these individuals would be to participate on, aside from programming that's offered at work furlough, would, but the main focus would be to participate on the community work crews in the areas of landscape maintenance, weed abatement, refuge collection. Uh, it, we're looking at, a, at, a, at an increase of about 50 participants in our short-term commitment program, which required modifications to our aging work furlough facility. And those additions will be, or the modifications will be completed by January of 2011. Uh, the modifications included cameras, additional cameras, security lighting, more ADA accessibility, and um, some modifications to a satellite control center. And again, we're looking at program implementation in January of 2011. We're also in discussions with the Sheriff's Department to look at those who are coming into our county jails for weekends, the weekenders we call them, to possibly maybe pull some of those out of the jail again to create some space uh, for those who are higher risk. And again, last thing I want to talk about is our evidence-based probation supervision program. I was in front of this board on October, or on August uh, 10th of this year uh, asking for permission to uh, accept money, uh, stimulus grant money, a seed money to start up this particular program. Um, we were very close to establishing a day reporting center out at work furlough and using our startup money to fund that. But in order to accept the stimulus money, we had to do uh, we had to, to, to be able to, to save jobs, and that was, focus, that was the focus on a lot of the stimulus grants that we received. So we decided to go in a different direction, and what we did was we established this particular program, and it's, it's a community program uh, designed for uh, probationers in the age range of 18 to 25. And the idea is to supervise them in, uh, on an intensive level in the community, offering approaches that are evidence-based. Uh, we created four specialized caseloads. We have probation officers in those caseloads. And the idea is to work with the offender and try to prevent them from going into jail for violations of probation and ultimately to state prison. Um, the success of this particular program will will be important because our, uh, the money that we would be getting annually from the state through Senate Bill 678 will be related to our success in this particular program. So the more offenders we are able to keep out of our state prison system with these approaches, the more funding that we can possibly get from the state. The program, uh, it's a uh, maximum of 200 people into the program at this point in time. We've screened 260, 177 have been accepted and are being currently supervised intensively in the community. Because we thought that there might be some target population sharing with our day reporting center, we decided to put the day reporting um, idea aside for right now and focus our efforts in, into this, in this particular direction. So again, just a reminder, uh, requesting, respectfully requesting that you authorize a home detention electronic monitoring program for our medically fragile, low-risk adult inmates uh, per Penal Code Section 1203.016, Paren G, and also to improve our home detention electronic, electronic monitoring program, administrative policies, rules, and regulations. It's Exhibit 1 attached to the board letter and adopt a resolution authorizing the transfer of inmates from the Sheriff's Department to the probation agency for the purpose of participating in short-term housing work crews. And at this point, I'm opening up for questions. Are there questions? Yeah, Madam Chair. Yes. Mark, going back to the pretrial stats that you had on the, mm -hmm. I think, the um, fourth or fifth uh, transfers. Um, you said you had 965 potential candidates, you know, and uh, 71 were released, mm -hmm. and 40 were successful. And mm -hmm. the what kind of savings then, or dollar savings, or do you have that information that were saved by keeping those uh, those uh, folks out of jail? You know, I do not have that information uh, in terms of a total savings. Um, must be pretty significant to keep that many uh, individuals out of jail. Right? I, I would think it would it would be that 
yeah, I, I would I would agree that there would be some savings attached to it. I just cannot mm -hmm. calculate that at this and, point. And of course, uh, fifty percent of those participants in obtaining employment, you know, during their release, which mm -hmm. is also a big benefit. You know, it is a big benefit because it allows them to continue to support their household themselves. So that might be something you might want to look at in mm -hmm. the future to see what the savings is to keeping those uh, folks out of jail, you know, to, out of the, you know, Linda's jail. <laughs> Um, I, I think the issue is that you can calculate a cost for bed day, per bed mm -hmm. day, mm -hmm. but the issue is is that you're not actually going to be able to take that out of the operation of the jail. So you're, you're still, you're, so that's why they're focusing on the fact that you're, main, you're securing and maintaining capacity in the jail for what the population that needs to be in the jail. Well, the capacity is probably one, but then the cost of keeping those folks is the other, right? I mean, maybe some possible overtime costs. It's really hard to calculate because if you have a facility that's overcrowded and you're pulling from that, you still have to staff the, the, the facility. But the main issue here is having more capacity for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 main, the main thing is to have bed space available for those higher risk inmates that come in. I think it's, I think it's a good program. I think you've done a good job. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Comments? Um, I'd like to certainly, Mark, you've got a team here, I see, um, and good to see our public defender. And, our and, and, and you reminded me, I, I just really want to, we can't do something, this, this is brand new to, uh, to, to Ventura County. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, obviously, we've done a lot of work in the in the juvenile arena. Now, this is now uh, working with adults, and it, it really took a team effort. Bless you. It really took a team effort to uh, to get this off the ground. And obviously, our sheriffs have been have been great partners. Commander Linda Oxner, who's here, um, Chief Deputy Dave Tennyson, have been big helps to us. We wouldn't be able to to have access to the inmates and in, in, in space to do the screens if it wasn't for their cooperation. The CEO's office and. Frank Chow's here in the back of the room has been a big help to us as well, as well as our internal people. And our whole pretrial unit is here. If you guys can just wave and say hello. Um, I mean, they've, they've really been doing a lot of the work. And I do want to publicly recognize our supervisor of that unit, Bill Stewart, who's here on the on the far right side. He, he has become the face of pretrial here in Ventura County. So having to uh, pitch this, this program to our, our bench and, and all of our partners hasn't been easy. So I, I did want to recognize him on that. He's done a really good job. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I'd just like to, like to compliment your leadership and, and the work being done. It's, oh, I think we've said it many times, but you guys are sort of the hidden uh, you know, the hidden, very important part, but doesn't have very big public face around here and stuff. And we really appreciate it because uh, I think we know how much is done. But if you can, if you can free up those beds mm -hmm. for higher risk, you know, you talk about a contribution to public safety. That's mm -hmm. a significant contribution to public safety and, and a cost effective one also. So mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I just Great really work. appreciate your attention to this. And some of these seem to say, yeah, why weren't we doing that sooner? So mm -hmm. I'm just glad that you're able to move it forward and the good work you do. Thank you. Let me, uh, if I can, there's, there's, I'm glad to see we're thinking outside the box, try to find some options. Tell me in this cost thing you've got here, mm -hmm. worked out, you've got, uh, net, you know, net county cost about 1.2. This is something within everybody's budget, your budget? What are you? Are you talking on the page two of the board? Yeah, letter? just these on the are, board. These are projected costs that we... Uh, put together, um, it was projected cost for the the running of our pretrial program in addition to our short term program. Short term wasn't going to be up and running until halfway through the fiscal year, so it was half the cost of what we thought it was going to be to run that particular program in addition to pretrial. The revenue that's listed up here, the seventy thousand two hundred, is is revenue that's generated off our paid work crews. Okay. that we have so that kind of offset the total cost so these were projected numbers at the start of the fiscal year um, you know, whether or not it's going to look like that at the end of the year I don't know at this point okay Madam Chair I want to thank Mark and his staff for an excellent job you know you continue to do good work uh, not only in this program but all the programs that you have especially over at the JJC too yeah. thank you like to um, make a motion? Or yes. Ready? Yes. Uh, make a motion to uh, uh, receive and file this uh, update on probation report. Second. 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 Second
Well, there's actually action items, too. Oh, I'm sorry. And, yeah. uh, and the recommended actions. Right. And adopt the recommended actions. Right. Thank you. Okay. So there's a motion and a second to take the recommended actions on this item. Move it forward for a full vote. Um, I, too, would like to thank the entire team and the cooperation and collaboration of the agencies who intersect this, um, the goals. And, and we, too, will be a model. And we'll have other counties looking to us. So please vote. And that passes unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Work. Have a nice day. Thank you. All right, board members, we're going to jump over now to our regular agenda and see if we can complete this. Um, item 44 was a continued item, as was announced earlier. Item 45 is the first of our behavioral health items. Sorry about that. Sorry, I understand. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Long, members of the board, and Mrs. Robinson, Melanie Roy from the Behavioral Health Department. Item 45 requests your um, authorization for uh, the Behavioral Health Department to enter into an agreement with Casa Pacifica. Uh, this is the, the first part of this is for uh, residential treatment, therapeutic behavioral services, parent-child interaction therapy, wraparound services. Um, the, the total amount um, for the entire uh, contract that those portions is 6.148389. And then for our crisis intervention response team, which is funded by MHSA funding in the amount of 1.136. Um, I wanted to point out one very brief thing um, in the uh, narrative uh, where it describes uh, the funding for the wraparound services due to the suspension of the 3632 mandate. Um, the portion that would normally be funded by the SB90 claim would be funded by schools and we're working on an MOU currently with schools to uh, work through that issue. Uh, that's a total of $132,765. I uh, just wanted to point that one thing out. Um, we're also looking for your approval for a, a program that would be funded by PE&I funding. Um, it's uh, supported behavior, behavioral services. It's very similar to the TBS program. So the in-home in supportive services for kids who uh, would otherwise uh, potentially be at risk for residential placement. Uh, CASA has quite a number of contracts with us. Uh, we've been very happy with them as a service provider. The quality of services is very good. Um, and a lot of these are contracts uh, that have been in place for quite a long time, actually, uh, that we've worked with CASA. Um, so if you have any questions. Other questions? Move the recommended action. Motion and a second on the recommended action. Please vote. Good work. Good luck with the school contract. Continue negotiations. Yep. And that passes unanimously. Item 46. Item 46 requests your approval for us to enter into a contract uh, with um, Clinicus del Camino Real. Uh, it's a PE&I project that provides funding for mental health services at their primary care clinics. It's very similar to what we're doing with the health care agency, uh, fully funded by um, Mental Health Services Act Prevention and Early Intervention funding. Uh, we've been working with them for a number of months now. I think one of the things that's been really nice about this is we've done some joint training. We've brought some evidence-based practice uh, training to their uh, organization. And it's been, um, you know, we've been working collaboratively with, with them on um, helping to bring more um, mental health services to their primary care clinics. And this was something that was uh, worked through in our stakeholder process and was called out in our stakeholder process as one of the programs um, that we submitted to the state for our PE and I funding. Move the recommended action. Motion is second on the recommended action. Please vote. That passes unanimously. Item 47. I thought that was continued. I think that that's, one was, that's that was continued. Fine. Item 47 was continued. Yeah. So Thank that you. wraps up that's yours. Me. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. All right. Now we go to item 50, which is adoption of resolution for implementing pre-tax payroll deduction. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Shannon Leslie with the CEO's Office, Labor Relations. 
Uh, before you today, we are recommending that we approve the attached resolution allowing for employee paid retirement contributions to be made on a pre-tax basis. This will apply to all county employees that are in our retirement system. Good work. Move recommended action. No questions. There's a motion and a second to adopt the recommended action. Please vote. And that passes unanimously. Sticky. Thank you. Thank you. Item 51. Actually, without, without lunch soon, I won't have the energy to push. Item 51, <laughs> public works item. To trans there he is. Transportation item. Checking for food. <laughs> Good afternoon, Supervisor. Supervisors, Chair Lawn, Ms. Robinson. Uh, this item is, uh, is our application for the Highway Safety Improvement Program grants. That's uh, pretty self-explanatory. We have uh, five projects uh, that are listed here. Um, one thing of note, uh, project number four on Vineyard Avenue, uh, that's actually a state highway. Um, we've been asked to put that in on behalf of Gold Coast. Uh, I cannot use road fund, nor do I believe we should use county funds in order to pay for the matching for that. That will have to either come from Gold Coast or VCTC should we get approved. Okay, no questions on that item. And there's a motion and a second to approve the recommended action. Please vote. That passes unanimously. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the work. Item 52. Watershed Protection District item. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Board. Uh, Ms. Robinson, uh, just for the record, um, my name is Norma Camacho, Director of the Watershed Protection District, and I'm basically here today to ask uh, for your authorization to proceed with some emergency work that needs to be done at the Waverly Channel. Um, just for the record also, I'd like to state that the project is located in Supervisorial District Number 2 and not Number 4, as was indicated in the Board letter. And again, although the rainfall over the weekend uh, did not cause additional damage, that we must uh, work in haste to get this uh, project rectified and constructed it, reconstructed as quickly as possible. So if I could answer any questions you may have on this project. Other questions? Don't hear any. Okay. Uh, move, move approval and another example why if we didn't have all this concrete, we wouldn't have the holes. In this. <laughs> Motion and a second. Please vote. That passes unanimously. Thank, thank you. you. Item 53, Supervisor Parks. Well, thank you. Uh, this item is uh, related to uh, the Southern California Association of Governments resolution that they have put forward to all of the um, uh, cities and counties within the, um, within the association. And we have, uh, if you look at the agenda item, we have modified it slightly to incorporate our, the way that we like to um, grow in Ventura County and where we like to see a lot of the, the cities take on the economic um, aspects of business and business growth. Uh, while we have a lot of um, excellent um, jobs that we've done in terms of expediting permitting, for example, and working with our partners and helping to make it a more business-friendly county. We've also included suggestions uh, re that we also want to make sure we protect our farmland and open space in the unincorporated county. So while it's, it's slightly modified to address that, the way that we grow here in Ventura County, which is different from other Southern California areas. Um, this pretty much stays in line with the rest of the SCAG proposals. So I would ask, I guess we, we have a speaker card on this, so before I make a motion, uh, we can hear the speakers. Supervisor Long. We do have a speaker. Thank you. Um, Doug Sullivan. Actually, I looked this up, and I guess there's about 180 cities that are speaking on the SCAG. Uh, the uh, four principal, principles of four for excellence, they call it. Um, uh, the comment in here is business-friendly principles. And um, I read that, and what I want to talk about is principle number four, and I'll read it. It says, the County of Ventura will continue to actively pursue the streamlining of all aspects of operations for the benefit of our residents and businesses. 
Our service excellence lean Six Sigma based process improvement program unique in the state has resulted in material reductions in the time requirements for permits and inspections. In addition to cost savings and improvements in many other county services, we will continue to work with our economic development partners and local cities to improve the county's attractiveness to new and existing businesses, including striving to maintain competitive taxes and fees and establishing good communications with our residents and business base. Some of that's true. What I'd like to talk about is what you're t telling us here, maybe this is just a boilerplate thing that all the cities did in the state, but what you're saying is that the, 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 the permit process that we have in the county works fine and we don't need to spend all kinds of money on new permit processing software. Um, so my, what I want to bring up is we spent uh, 5 to $7.6 million on software with no competitive bids, and yet businesses are going to be saddled with half the fees to pay for that software when in reality we probably could have got a software with considerably less money. So in reality, we're kind of straddling businesses with more fees and taxes and, and stuff like that. So I'm not against this resolution. What I'm trying to point out is that what we do and what we say are two different things in this county. So what I'd like to see is more competitive bidding, and if you're going to do everything, anything over $100,000 should go to competitive bidding, and we shouldn't try to hide behind these little backdoor deals where we say, not backdoor deals, but say it's a upgrade or, or we have to do an emergency contract or this contract needs to be done because of this. I just want to see more transparency and more competitive bidding in this, in this county. And this doesn't really say exactly what the county does. They're not, in a lot of regards, farmers are here every day, every week. You guys are making it more restrictive for farming. You're making it more restrictive for building in this county. It's becoming more restrictive. It's not becoming easier, and it's not becoming any faster, no matter what this document says. So that's what I'm trying to bring up, is that it's not, it's not getting any better. I know you had difficulty regarding the um, competitive bidding related to our um, upgrading of a computer system that we already have in place, which we did essentially to assist streamlining. And the county has recently underwent a streamlining to our permit processing that has resulted in reduced time for applicants as well as uh, being able to move forward on their projects. You know, so. Uh, I, I know it, uh, it is it is difficult when you have to pay for computer upgrades, but the objective for those upgrades was actually a business friendly uh, approach. It reduces the time for those applicants to get their pro projects processed. The software is not going to be implemented until 2012. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's just it's one of the, it's kind of a double edged sword. In one way, it, it is meant to reduce the amount of time and and make it more efficient. Um, at the set, same way, you want to uh, say, well, we shouldn't be spending the money. So it, it, was a, it was a decision that the board made to make it more efficient. I'm going to read one paragraph on competitive bidding that the, that the state attorney generals wrote in one of their, one of their briefs, and I'll, and I'll be done with this. Basically, it's quotes, the provisions, of requiring, the provisions requiring competitive bidding are for the purpose of inviting competition to guard against favoritism, improvidence, extravagance, fraud, corruption, to steer the best work for or supplies at the lowest price practical, and they are enacted for the benefit of property holders and taxpayers, and not enrichment of bidders, and should be so construed and administered as to accomplish such purpose fairly and reasonably with sole reference to public interest. And I believe that the Excel contract did not meet any of that. That's all well, I, I have to definitely say. do. Okay. do support that, and uh, this was an upgrade of a system we could have started at scratch too. Okay. okay. Thank you for your comments. Thanks. So with that, I'll go ahead and, and move that we adopt the resolution. I, uh, I just need to make a comment on this. Um, one of the things I think is critical that uh, I appreciate SCAG doing, which is to try to make this state more business friendly, because we have a real issue in this state that not being very business friendly through you know, tax, legal, uh, labor laws, all the other things. I just hope that we really take to heart we're trying to say here you know Ventura County I can just tell you from the business world looks at it as a very unfriendly business place to do business it's just not it's not easy to do business in Ventura County um, and so I hope that we really do take in in this and I know that the original document was probably more business friendly than this document is we've made some changes here and we have to find that balance between land use and business as I've said before because of our land use policies, we would never be business friendly to another Amgen or anybody else that wants to come in because there's not enough land for them to build in cities. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to look at this, but we have to hopefully take this to real heart and, and make a real commitment to being business friendly or else we're not going to see the jobs we need in this county for the people of our county. 
Thank you, and, and it is good that we do recognize the importance of the environment and agriculture in our county. If we put a lot of development in the unincorporated area, we wouldn't be able to have sustainable agriculture. So I think it's really important that we hold to our, our guidelines of orderly development and also do what we can working with our partners, VACIDA and EDC, VC, to um, assist businesses that want to come to the community, find places where they can be, and then also grow our existing businesses. A second the motion, and thank you for uh, serving on SCAG and working with SCAG with us. Okay, and we're going to vote on this, and um, I would just say that um, uh, SCAG did bring this forward to, to send a, a message um, statewide. Uh, I think that it did not preclude every county to take a look at um, customizing this to fit what has been both their history and their practice. Uh, which is, I think, what's been brought forward here. I think it still does say um, that uh, we were able to achieve the balance we need by working with our business community uh, within the cities and continue to support the major industry of agriculture in the county. So it was uh, a customized fine balance. Please vote. And that passes unanimously. Okay, that completes our regular agenda. We right. have closed session. Do we expect an announcement? Pardon me? Correspondence. correspondence sorry. Madam Chair, I've got two things. One, I'd like to move the uh, correspondence calendar. And uh, There's a motion and a second to move the correspondence calendar. And please vote on that. Being and that passes. And um, I, uh, I made the motion that we bring back the... Uh, the item on the appointments uh, to the December 7th meeting, not realizing that was a meeting that we're going to have in Santa Paula. I think it probably makes more sense for us to, to do the, that, the meeting after that when we're here in the boardroom on the 14th rather than in Santa Paula. So I'd like to make a motion to reconsider. Talk to County Council. He thought we should make a motion to reconsider just to, just to make that, okay. just to modify that motion. That probably makes so, sense. Yeah. Thank you. So, motion to reconsider. Um, the, item 49. The motion to reconsider the motion that we made on item 49. And first, it's a motion to reconsider, and then you got to do a motion to, to act on it. Right. Yeah. Okay, there's a motion and a second to reconsider item 49. And there's, let's vote to, to reconsider it. And that passes, and then there is... And I'd like to make the motion to uh, have that item come back on uh, December 14th and ask uh, either the CEO's office or the clerk to communicate to uh, Mr. Melvin and, and appropriate parties about the change right. in the date uh, so that they know. Okay, so that will now come back on the 14th. And please vote on that. Thank you for that consideration. Okay, that, that is the action then. Okay, now back to County Council. Any closed session announcements anticipated? Madam Chair, there will be no announcements today. Okay. And then I'd like to just for the public uh, to know that um, on November 30th, there is a special meeting of the board. Uh, on December 7th, we will be in Santa Paula for our regular meeting, and happy Thanksgiving to all. Thank you.